Hey guys, this is Frank Decker, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overeem. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. DJ Dillashaw. You're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to Submission Radio, episode 192. It's Dennis Gratif here with Casper Rosalowski on the 10th of July. Coming at you straight out of Melbourne. It's a Wednesday. And man, Cast, I don't know if people can tell at home, but based on what I'm wearing, based on the Jane Fonda workout vinyl sitting right behind me, based on this Power Ranger t-shirt that I'm wearing today, we have a big lineup for the fans, the listeners, the friends of Submission Radio this week. That's right. We get a big, juicy, sexy lineup this week. If you can believe it, 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 it has been a crazy week here. It's been a crazy morning here at Submission Radio. If you can believe it, the lineup was actually going to be even bigger, but it's still a big lineup. That's how big the lineup is. That's how sexy and juicy the lineup is. We've got Stephen Wonderboy Thompson coming back to Submission Radio, coming home in many a way. Uh, we were on a live chat. We were on a live stream chat the other day. Someone said, when are you getting Wonderboy Thompson back on the program? We gave a cheeky wink. Today is that day. Merry mm-hmm. Christmas to that person. And speaking the- of winks, Casper. Oh, <laughs> look at that segment. <laughs> speaking of winks, Coach Wink, Coach Mike Winklejohn, is going to be on the program, back on Submission Radio. A lot to speak to the man about. Obviously, Holly Holm, a devastating loss and a devastating knockout at the hands of Amanda Nunes this past weekend, UFC 239. John Jones getting a win, but coming under a lot of scrutiny against Thiago Santos, so he's the perfect man to speak to. Also, what happened between Coach Wink and Diego Sanchez? Well, not so much Coach Wink, but the Jackson Winklejohn team and Diego Sanchez. So there's a lot of questions for him that hopefully we'll have answered by the end of this program. Also, Anthony Smith coming back on the program. It's been a long time since we've spoken to Anthony Smith. We want to get his thoughts on UFC 239. Of course, him and Luke Rockhold have gone back and forth for a long time. Want to get his thoughts on Rockhold's loss over the weekend. John Jones's win over Thiago Santos. Also, where he stands in the division after his win over Alexander Gustafsson. A fascinating man to speak to. Chai Lewis Parry, fresh off his win to become the heavyweight champion in Abu Dhabi this past weekend, improving his MMA record to 8 and 0. Want to get the man on to talk about a whole bunch of things. What's going on? Why is he in the UFC? Why isn't he in Bellator? Why isn't he being signed to major organizations? I want to talk about that. And of course, the man has a long standing history and feud with John Jones. The man, the two of them clashed at an expo earlier in the year, so we've got to get. You know, the hot goss from that. So hopefully Chai has a couple of stories for us. That's not even all. We got more guests, don't we, Dennis? That's right, Cass. We had a lot of people sort of hitting us up. They go, well, what do you think of uh, this guy doing? What do you think of James Lynch doing great? What do you think of uh, Jim Edwards with his fantastic Darren Till interview? What do you think of Oscar Willis doing fantastic coverage? What do you think of Anthony Walker? The fact of the matter is all these guys are our friends. And every time we see them do something awesome and amazing, For us, it's all about sort of acknowledging it, making sure they get the credit that they deserve. And this man that's going to be on the program this week, Aaron Bronstadter, obviously does an amazing job with TSN. But he had a really, really cool moment with Israel Adesanya during UFC 239 coverage where they witnessed uh, Israel's live reaction to Masvidal's knockout over Ben Askren. He had that amazing video that came out. So we wanted to talk to the man about that and a whole lot more when it comes to UFC 239. The guy had a great, great Great amount of content coming from UFC 239. And by the way, all those guys, all those guys did it. And everybody should check them all out because there was some fantastic coverage all through UFC 239. So, Cass, before we jump to that, just a quick reminder of everybody at home. I am wearing a Mark Hughes Foundation beanie. They help support brain cancer and raising money towards that. You guys can buy a sweet beanie for $25. Uh, there's the website, Mark Hughes Foundation. Check it out. And if you tag us in the picture, we will retweet you this month. Uh, through Twitter. So do that. Also, uh, jump on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook. You can message us, comment below. We read all of the comments. Me and Casper both do. We both manage all those uh, channels. Uh, Casper does an amazing job of responding to everybody's YouTube uh, comments, which I love. There's so many characters down there. It's almost a a community all in itself. Always on Facebook and Instagram and uh, Twitter, you guys can message us directly too. So don't be shy. Message us, comment, share. Uh, Just 
feel free to communicate with us. We love having a bit of a chat with all you guys. Don't feel like uh, don't feel like you can't say anything to us. We 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 can take a joke and we love it. And also uh, keep an eye uh, down on the merchandise section um, of YouTube because we have something really really cool coming out um, around the corner. I think you guys are going to like it. I know a lot of people sort of, sort of have spoken about our merch about the fact that they love the submission radio logo tea but they want something a little bit juicier mm. uh casper has come up with something pretty amazing so uh we don't we don't want to spoil anything just yet but let's just say if you're an aussie mma fan i kind of think this is i don't know Cas. i reckon you're, you're an evil genius i kind of feel like this is going to be really really cool so keep an eye on that and when that pops up I'm, i feel like you guys are going to want to buy one or two uh, pieces of merch as well also keep in mind that uh certain pieces of merch are limited edition so when it go, when it goes up there's no telling for how long it's going to be up for and how long we're going to keep it around for. So jump on it quickly so you don't miss out. Anyway, with all that said, Cass, we have a huge show of submission radio coming right up. We have our first guest on the line. It's his first time on the program and you are about to introduce him. All right, guys. Our next guest is an accomplished kickboxer who has made a great jump over to MMA and is undefeated with eight wins fighting big companies such as One and Bama. He is now the UAE Warriors heavyweight champion after a big win this past weekend. He joins us now on the program for the very first time. Look at that. He's even on Skype. Chopper Chai Lewis Parry. Welcome to Submission Radio for the first time. How are you, man? I'm doing fabulous at 11.30 at night. <laughs> Thank you, bro. <laughs> Well, Chai, we are, well, we're doing good. And by the way, for people that don't know, you were supposed to join us on the program yes, uh, last week at 3 a.m., so it's an improvement. <laughs> we're working on times, 11.30 at night, better than 3 a.m., and we'll yeah. gradually get to that acceptable area where you can feel a bit better at being on the show. <laughs> so, you let's guys talk. weren't trying to show me any mercy last week, man. <laughs> you had your fight. You had your fight that <laughs> week. <laughs> we're like, hey, can you come on? <laughs> 3 in the morning. Yeah. Hey, the Australian fans wanted to hear from you, man. All the fans around the world wanted to hear from you. Quickly, on that win against Muhammad Hassan last weekend, how was the experience of fighting in Abu Dhabi and winning the heavyweight title? And having such a dominant performance over there, I mean, man, that fight was very, very quick. It was very quick. And um, I'll be honest, the experience in Abu Dhabi, uh, that's the third time I fought in the UAE. And all three times um, were probably my favorite experiences just because of the way that people treat you over there. It's, it's very, it's very different. I mean, there's a lot of respect. I think it's a culture built on respect and, um, and, uh, well for me anyway, and they, they've all treated me really, really well. So, so the experience in itself as a whole, um, was, was a pleasant one, but, uh, winning was just a bonus, you know? Did you, did you expect the fight to be over so quickly when you sort of went in there and, and before you even got started? Do you know, I never, I never plan like that's the, that's the what, that's the second time in the UAE that I had a, a fast knockout. You know, the first time was in Glory, mm. in Dubai, and um, you don't plan for those things. But I will, I will say this, and I'm sure it's something that you probably would bring up later on in the conversation. But I never felt so calm in in this fight. For, uh, for example, um, I was very stoic, like everything just felt. I mean, you could just tell by the way that I walked out, I was just actually, I decided that I was just going to have fun. Hmm. And I think that's when you're, that's when you're most tuned in. I was so relaxed. I was so calm. I didn't, in a weird way, I didn't care. There was no pressure. I didn't care what happened. I was just like, eh, win or lose. I'm not fussed. And that made me, I think, more dangerous. Uh, because I was able to, it felt like I was just slowing everything down, you know? And, um, and I saw... The opening, like right there, you know. He, I don't know why he came out southpaw. He's not a southpaw fighter, but he came out southpaw and um, and and walked straight onto that right. So I don't know. It just felt it felt really really stoic. That's the best word I got. And I got to thank um, Vinny Shawman. I've been talking to a mind coach, Vinny Shawman, um, over the last sort of few weeks, and he he was just kind of reaffirming things that I already knew about myself. And um, man, it worked. It worked. The guy, the guy, the guy's uh, methods work for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Like with mind coaches, um, just randomly, I was watching a video last night. It was about like uh, fighters who have sort of alternate personas. Like Mike Tyson, when he'd go in the ring, he wouldn't be Mike Tyson. He'd be Iron Mike, Sugar Ray. Leonard wouldn't be, you know, yeah. Ray Leonard. He'd be Sugar Ray. It was an alternate ego. It was like a different human being, you know, the Bronze Bomber. And I'm, I'm wondering when you're talking about how you were so calm. How do you, how do you sort of um, 
how do you tap into that? Uh, you know, you hear so many fighters talking about how sometimes they were in the wrong mindset or the right mindset. Sometimes they can't turn it on. Sometimes they can't. How, how do you get in that mindset and get in that zone and, and be so calm and stoic? Well, I, know, I stood there for a minute and I just thought to myself, what would Jack Burton do? Hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and it was like a, a big trouble in Little China moment. I just, I just felt like, um, like it, the, the, the most fun I had was in being myself like i didn't i didn't i wasn't trying to force being mad at my opponent or or to force being aggressive i was just like i genuinely just didn't really care that i was there like obviously i'm grateful for the opportunity but there was a lot of, of pressure on it i think and um I, I i eliminated that pressure just by enjoying the experience and being there and kind of doing what i wanted to do took my time walking out and um i think that was that was the, the secret it was in not really caring because i think if you care too much you can put pressure on yourself um and the wrong kind of pressure and um i didn't want that i didn't want that i wanted to have fun the most important thing is i wanted to have fun and i did i had the most fun i've had so far and the result was uh was kind of like a pristine one you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're a little bit of a fader a bit stoic and i think it paid off and you said on your instagram the Muhammad suffered four face fractures from your fight. I mean, did you have any idea when you landed that shot that was how bad the damage was? Because when when I watched the fight, I mean, it's over so quickly. You don't realize exactly, you know, if, if he's stunned, if he's hurt. But four face fractures, that's pretty heavy. Yeah, well, I knew, you know when, um, see, this, <laughs> this is, this is going to make me sound bad. But uh, <laughs> back in the day, like when I used to work on the door, um, if if you'd get people that would uh, door lights uh, security work, mm -hmm. if um if you would get people that would that would try and sneak something, or they would try and like do a little blind side or a you know, sneaky shot, I would just use my head because it's the shortest distance. And sometimes the as you need headbutt them, I was in a headbutt. <laughs> so and you just create distance that way. But if you you know if you do a headbutt the right way, you can connect and you don't feel a thing. And that's kind of how it felt. It was like I, I landed. I knew it was solid, but it felt like I'd hardly, I'd hardly touched him. Mm. But I, I just knew it was a solid shot. But when I, when I went over to him and he was on the floor, I, I noticed he was, he, he wasn't there. So I, I kind of, I wasn't really trying to hit him to damage him. I was just, just going to keep hitting because I want, you know, so the referee could stop it. But I could see he wasn't, he wasn't fully, the, he wasn't the full ticket, you know. <laughs> the full ticket yeah i, I was gonna say um the commentators are talking about something to do with the water throwing incident and how this fight was personal um w w what exactly happened there no it wasn't per I, listen man i don't take anything personal like like the only thing i took personal was the, the john jones thing but that's um that's nothing to do with this like this this wasn't personal i like i get under people's skin you know just i like to have a laugh i was having a laugh there he said something to me um he said, uh, c can I be expletive? Of course. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, right. Australia, no, say whatever he... you want. <laughs> he said he was going to cut my dick off. So, <laughs> when did so he I say told this? Him to... So I told that when I threw the water. So I told him to cool off. <laughs> and that's when I threw the water on him, man. And just, it was like he was trying to force like this, this like fake aggression, I guess. He had to try and find a way to be mad at me. And, um, I ended up like that. I'm the wrong person to do that with because nothing really bothers me too much. And um, I'll just end up giggling at your expense. So, and then you'll be mad and then you're off your, off your, your, uh, <laughs> off your game plan, you know? So yeah, he said he's going to cut my dick off or something in two days. He kept saying in two days, in two days. I, <laughs> dick I was like, yeah, all right. If you can reach it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was pretty much it. I mean, wow, that's some um, unbelievable trash talk, Chai. It seems like the guy might have been watching videos of Charles Sonnen and, and Conor McGregor and kind of tried to put his own <laughs> twist on it, and it didn't quite work out. I don't know if that, I don't know if that's uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. But anyway, you are now eight and zero in your MMA career, and I guess the big question from fans is: Are you interested in having a run in the UFC? And I, I think I've seen some stuff in the news where you've mentioned. Maybe they've been in touch with you in the past. What, what kind of relationship have you had with the company? Have they tried to offer you a contract in the past? Yeah, I've, I've got a good relationship with them, um, mm. especially with um, being training partners with DC. DC, you know, um, actually got a good deal for me, but it was just 
the timing wasn't right. Like the timing wasn't right. I, I had obligations with, with other promotions that I, that I couldn't get out of. And then there was, there's a lot of, pol man, there's so much politics in this game. This game is like not something I would have my, my son pursue. Just hmm. because there's so much drama, mate. There's so much drama. And um, then you, you don't fight for a company for four years, but yet they stay, they still own you. And they've, you, and so the, the thing with the UFC and Bellator, which I've had offers from both, um, is they won't accept you without a release letter from anybody. So if a company says they're not going to give a release letter, you're fucked. You're hmm. absolutely fucked. The UFC won't take you. Bellator won't take you. Regardless of whether the contract says you're out of it or not. They need a release letter. So companies like to, certain companies, which I won't name, but I'm sure you can figure out, um, they like to fuck careers of guys. Fight. They try and ruin fighters' careers. So you don't do anything for them. You haven't mentioned them. They, they haven't mentioned you. They're not offering you nothing, but they won't just give you a release letter to say, hey, man, good luck in your career. They just want to fuck you. And and that's kind of what I've been dealing with for the last four years. Otherwise, I'd have been in the UFC a long time ago. I'd have been having my run in the, in the UFC a long time ago. So it's drama politics that is keeping me out of that company. That's it. That's all it is. Mm, I guess the big question is, uh, it's a process that you've been dealing with for a few years. Are you any closer to resolving it without going into too much detail? Or are you still at the same spot uh, that you were at four years ago? Because I guess fans want to know if there's any chance you might be in the UFC anytime soon, at least, you know? It's, it's close to being resolved. But you know what? You just don't know when they're going to try and jam a finger up your ass. Yeah. So that's why I'm just like, man, you never know. You just never know. But it, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's close to being dealt with. And, and um, hopefully uh, by the end of the year, I will, uh, I'll be able to make that, um, make that decision as to where I go. But... But um, you don't want to like uh, it's it's weird. It's like I, I'm. It's hard for me to keep my mouth shut. But I've learned over the years that it's best to. Sometimes mm. it's, it's just best to. But uh, yeah, there's people out there that are doing wrong by a lot of people. I'm not the only one. I'm not just a victim. But you know, they look after their their uh, their um their prize fighters and and uh, us other guys who who have the potential to make a career elsewhere and make money elsewhere have a good have a good life they just want to stop that because they're spiteful little little shit asses and that's that's all it comes down to spiteful little businessmen they don't know anything about fighting they know nothing about fighting they know about business and they know about fucking people that's it that's that's what it comes down to man that's crazy and, and obviously well, i'm not for fucking yeah, well, I did. I, well, yeah, I, I asked Muhammad Hassan, you know. Uh, he definitely, he, he definitely <laughs> not the guy for, for fucking. And obviously, we're sorry to hear that, you know, you're sort of going through these things. I know a lot of people would like to see you in the UFC or, you know, potentially another company. You, you said you'd have your UFC run a long time ago. Is it kind of, is that the goal for you, the UFC? Or would you be exploring, you know, other potential companies as well? Or has it kind of always been a dream for you to be in the UFC? No, I think it's... It's a dream for most people to be in the UFC, but I, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I'm not really driven by like, like I've said this before. I'm not like chasing being UFC heavyweight world champion. Like, I'm not fast. Like, I, I, I like, I thrive on the idea of of competing against like legends and that. You know, so like I'd mentioned um, before that it'd be like a dream come true to fight someone like Mark Hunt. You know, just mm. because he's he's a <clears throat> he's a, he's a legend of the sport. And um and he's a pure strike he's a striker, you know, K one you know come from K one K one days, so out of all respect you know I, I just want to fight who I consider to be like like real fighters the best people, and they don't they're not they're not always all in the UFC. Um, I think it'd be nice to to be at the pinnacle and and compete at that pinnacle and just see where you stand, especially after all this time. I, I should have been there a long time ago, um, but it's just right now it's just. Let's see what happens, man. Like I, again, I'm in this 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 mindset of not really caring. I'm not fussed. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's not going to rule the 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 rest of my days in this career. It's just like, man, we'll see what happens. And in that way, there's no pressure on me, but there's no disappointment at the same time. Mm. <clears throat> you mentioned John Jones before. He uh, defended his title this past weekend. He fought as well. And he fought against Thiago Santos, a guy that many people didn't give much of a chance to, but a guy that really surprised all of fans and was able to have a really, really close fight with John Jones with a busted knee. I mean, did you see that fight? And what did you think of John Jones's performance, what Thiago Santos was able to do? 
Yeah, I saw it. I watched it the day after. I think I, I found um, I found a, a link of it. I watched it, and I <laughs> think um, I think mean, look, I think John is is um, a remarkable fighter. You know, he's he he accepts challenges and and he and he beats them um, time and time again. Uh, I think Santos maybe got a little gun shy in the like second round and sort of started playing the back foot guy. But when he was going forward and going wild, he was a problem. You know, he was a big problem. He kind of stopped kicking the leg as well. Before he did the knee, he stopped, he stopped low kicks. And I think I've always said to people, low kick that guy because there's no meat in his legs. And when he was doing that, John was switching stances all the time because his, his legs were, were, were bruised up, you know. Um, but I think I, I did say a long time ago, I said, if anyone's going to be a problem for him, it's going to be that sort of wild, reckless style, you know. And, um, and look, he went five rounds with an absolutely obliterated knee, which is an achievement. That's a win for me, you know, regardless of, of how active he was in the rounds. I think he did remarkable. I know what it's like to be in there with a bum knee. Um, mm. I tore my MCO in a fight right at the beginning of the fight, and and just the stability is is ridiculous. There, there is no stability. Um, so yeah, fair play to him. But um, nah, fuck John, man. I'm not I'm not happy. I'm not happy for him at any time. <laughs> any time. Well, well, I was gonna say, obviously Tiago, a great Muay Thai fighter, a guy that's really great on his feet. A lot of people have sort of. Put the comparison to yourself if you're ever in the UFC, how you and John would match up, and also how that would look. I mean, seeing the success that Tiago had, did it? Did you have moments in your head that you, you where you imagined yourself fighting John and what that would look like, especially after seeing this latest performance from John and Santos? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, how do you think that I'm would not, go? I'm not delusional, and I'm not going to sit here and say I'm the best MMA fighter in the world, and I'm this, and I'm that, and I could beat the best. Because I've I've been in there with with uh, with DC, say people like DC and Kane, and their wrestling is just another level. So if John's on, wrestling is on that level, his wrestling is going to be better than mine. I didn't grow up wrestling. I don't enjoy doing it. I do it because I have to, but I don't enjoy. It's not something that I'm like. I'm excited by. I get to the gym. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to wrestle. I can't wait to do jujitsu. Like that's to me, honestly, out of all of the the. Um, the aspects of mixed martial arts, they're boring to me. I like punching. I like kicking. I like kneeing. I'm a striker. He, John has got an ego. This is the thing. He has a massive ego, and he says it himself. In every fight, he doesn't want to take people down if they're strikers. He wants to beat them at their game. So if that's true, and he stood with me, I would destroy him. He could not stand with me. He's got no power. So it's not, I'm not delusional in saying I'm a better MMA fighter because I'm not. Definitely not. He can wrestle. He's a great grappler. If, if, if the fight went to the ground, he, he'd probably have the fight there. That's just me being honest. It's not being delusional. If he boxed with me, he'd die. If he kickboxed with me, he'd die. So his ego, it, it, and as far as I'm concerned, if he went to take me down, he's, he's lost. He's lost. He'd know in himself that he lost. So if he took me down and, and, and worked for three minutes and got a, uh, an Americana or whatever... <clears throat> He's lost. He might have won on the on the, on the <clears throat> official scorecard or whatever, but he has lost the, the the battle because he couldn't beat me where I was strong. And that's just how I see it. It's not it's not delusions and me trying to say that I'm better than John Jones and blah blah. blah. It's not. He's a, all round. He's a better guy. He's been doing it a lot longer than me. But um, but I could beat him striking ten times out of ten all day long. And there's a lot of people that could. There was a lot of people that could. You just got to play that. You got to pull him into that game, you know? <clears throat> I think that's the reality. Mm. I, I like your breakdown, China. We appreciate the honesty. Just at the top of, obviously, at the, the interview, you mentioned how John Jones thing is the only thing that was ever really personal for you. And you mentioned before, you're not really happy for him anytime. Where, where, where did it all, all begin, this sort of feud with John Jones? It, it began where it shouldn't have began like it was none of my business it was none of his business and i'm if if you ask anybody that knows me or anybody that's even interacted with me i am not uh um i'm not a, a bullying personality or i'm not an attention seeker i'm not interested in conflict i'm peaceful i'm calm like i'm not interested in that like that's that's just not my persona or, or anything to do with my character 
so we were we was DC was doing a, um like uh, they were doing that interview. Do you remember they had that interview where they sat with Joe Rogan? Mm. Oh, yeah, the tense one. Classic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it was that day they were filming that in Vegas, and we were there. Um, they had Steve Pay was there because he was fighting for Doom. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else was there. I can't remember. It was that whole unbreakable press conference mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So we were there, and I was eating food, and they had the interview. And this is the first time I've met John or interacted with him and I'm watching him on this interview and I was like, oh, do you know what? He doesn't seem like a bad guy. I think people have got him wrong. He's misunderstood. So I was actually I was mindful of the guy's um, persona on camera thinking that's who he is in, in real life, you know? Nothing's going to change. Literally no word of a lie, no exaggeration. As soon as that camera went off the guy was he was, he was vile. That's the best word I got. He was vile. The stuff that was coming out of his mouth to DC, it wasn't to me, to DC was vile. You don't talk to people like that. And that just immediately, I was like, oh, wow, I'm surprised. I was like, oh, wow. Can you really go from that? How do you go from being so nice to being just disgusting? Like, you don't say, there's certain things you just don't say. And you, you, especially when you're that high up, why would you want people to, to perceive you that way? And, I mean, his actions time and time again have, um, have, have proven the type of person he is. But for some reason, he just gets let off. I don't get it. You don't get away with stuff like that in real life, you know? And um, anyway, we went out. We, we, we left to the car, into the car park and was going to get in the car. And he literally, him and his manager, followed us out the door. <laughs> and I'm quiet. I don't get involved in other people's beef. That's, that was DC's beef. Like, that's, that's his thing. He's the one fighting him. I'm just mm -hmm. a training partner. It's nothing to do with me. And... Um, uh, we all get in the car. I go to get in the car and he just, his attention became on me. And he was like, he was just calling me. A, he was like, you're a big bitch and <laughs> your, muscle don't, your muscle don't mean shit. And so this I, was, you didn't, you didn't say anything to him. Dude, I never said nothing unprovoked. to him. I never said a single word. I didn't even look at the guy. It's just, I was getting, it's when my back was turned I got in the car and he's like, oh, I could fuck you up. And I just said, you know what? I can't let this slide. I can't let this slide. I'm not letting someone just talk to me like that. So I turned. I said, "All right, cool. Then, then, then do it. Like we'll do it right now." And and I was in that mode where we're not in a fight. Like this isn't this isn't like a, a, a an MMA fight where we've got to wait for the referee and the rules. Like there's, <laughs> there's there's a rock right here. There's a rock. There's rocks around. I was like, I'll put one, pick one of these rocks up, mate, and I put it through your face. How about that? And he kind of shut up because I think he saw that I wasn't I wasn't playing. I wasn't. I wasn't up for just chatting shit. And obviously, no one really wants a rock thrown at him, regardless of if it hits or not. I, I don't think yeah. I'd want him throwing rocks at me. <laughs> mm, yeah. So we got in the car, and that was the end of that. And we were laughing about it in the car on the way to the hotel. And we got to the hotel, DC changed, because then it was the big press conference that mm. the Umbrella had all the fighters on the stage, and, and there were, you know, Khabib was there and that. So the whole, the whole team was there. Luke was there. He was fighting Weidman, I think, and... Everyone was there anyway. <clears throat> and um, I was in the back. We just got to the back. This is at the MGM. We just got uh, through the back and everyone was doing media. Um, and I bumped into Alistair over him. And I hadn't seen him in a while. So those guys carried on walking and went to like DC's room, changing room or whatever. And I'm talking to Alistair and just having a catch up. I was, sitting there. I was there for like 10 minutes. When I turned around, everyone had gone. But here comes John and his brothers. And like an entourage. There was a lot of people. There was a lot of people like in this group, this entourage with him. Some of them, I think, are like the UFC runners and that, you know, and the people that tell mm. me where to go. But, mm. but it just all I saw was a big group with three big dudes. And John in the middle. Kind of like he's, he's the, you know, he's Ajax of the Warriors. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and he's, he's walking this strut. And I just thought, well, I'm on my own. I said, you know what? I'm just going to walk straight through him. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not really going to get into it. I'm not trying to get into some squabble with, with a big group of people. And um, he, uh, he kind of squares up to me. <laughs> and I was just like, all right, cool. What are you going to do? What are you going to do now? And his brother sort of just, just jumps over and he starts like he's trying to fight me. <laughs> he's, he's trying to he's getting all involved then John when he's behind his brother he starts talking yeah yeah what are you going to do all this and I was like so I grabbed his brother's tits 
because <laughs> he's quite fat. Mm. Which which so brother was this? Was this his older seven. brother? Is he, uh, which one was it? The one that plays football. They both play football. I think yeah, they both do. Yeah, fat yeah. one. Who's the fat one? The one is not as tall. There's a one that's taller than me. Oh, okay. I think I think I got you. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, but then there's a shorter one who's fat. So then, I, I don't know. Do they both play? I right, who cares, mate? He's yeah, got yeah. fat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Arthur. So, yeah. Arthur, I think his name is. Yeah. Arthur. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Amy. I call him Amy. <laughs> um, yeah. So I just squeezed his because like, look, I know how to antag like antagonize people and get under their skin. Like, so I just squeezed his his boobs. And he's like, what the fuck are you? And everything, all this swearing, all this rubbish. And I'm laughing. But I sort of directed it at John. I was like, yeah, look, you hide behind your brothers. I said, but you had the chance. I was just standing right in front of you. You had a chance to do something. You ain't going to do nothing. And I think it's just because, I don't know if it's, if it's because he, um, he, it's not because he's scared. So a lot of people think that, oh, you, you think he's scared of you? No, it's not because he's scared. No, he's a man. He's not scared. But I think he was wary of what I would have been willing to do as I think anybody is if you back try and back somebody into a corner you, you should be a bit concerned about what they could do they would they've mm. got to find an escape route you know so mm. um I wasn't and did, did, sorry to... sorry to jump in but it, did Arthur do anything when you grabbed him by the chest yeah, area he started going like he was going to go for me like and then there was yeah. all this security there and I was you know it was like he was trying to make a big fuss, but he weren't going to do nothing. He, he wasn't really going to do anything, but he wanted to make it look like he was going to do something. Yeah. And there's all this shit, all this fuss. They actually had, Ariel was doing an interview at the time and they turned the cameras. So they got it all on camera, but they mm. never released it. They never <laughs> released it because it would have made John look bad. Mm. It would have made him look bad. And then to them, who is this guy? Who the hell am I? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm, I'm just, look, the one thing I want to make clear is um, obviously I had a had a, a I didn't have a run in with him uh, at the the Body Power Expo. I went to look for him, so it wasn't like we just happened to cross paths. I was there doing something for one of my sponsors, and mm -hmm. someone said, "Oh, did you know John's here?" Mm -hmm. And I was like, "You know what? The last time I saw you, you tried to run up on me, so now I'm going to return the favor." That's what that was. It wasn't I was looking for clout or I was trying to challenge him. Uh, or get myself my name out there it was none of that it was personal because the guy had been sending me messages all over the last couple of years sending me these mm. dms in the middle of the night what would he say in really? the dms wow. what, what was dude, he saying dude this guy honestly this guy do you know what i didn't even post what the stuff that he said because people don't need to see that mm. people don't need to see how disgusting he is they they, they should if people can't see it without Without me posting um, uh, Twitter messages and stuff like that, then, then you know what? You, you deserve to have him as your idol and as mm. your champion because you're blind. So this, this was unprovoked? He just started DMing you? Dude, four in the morning, I'll just start getting long <laughs> fucking messages. Really? It'll wow. be because I say something like, like he'll be battling back and forth with DC or Rosendo or one of the, one of the team. And then I'll chime in and say something like simple, like you got legs like Foghorn Leghorn, or <laughs> I'll just send him a picture of a chicken's legs. And for some <laughs> reason that really gets to him. If you talk about his legs, you get to that guy. And he sent me messages talking about his legs, defending his legs. Yeah, but my legs are worth 5 million and, and my legs knocked out your, tr your, 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 your daddy or some shit like that. Like he just talks <laughs> nonsense, man. And I'm just like, I'm looking at it and I'm too witty to like, you can't really bother me with stuff like that. Like I'll come back with, with funny stuff. Do you know what I mean? I won't, I won't go back mm. and say, yeah, well, guess what? My legs will, will beat your mama. Or do you know what I mean? I'm not going to come back with that nonsense. I just, <laughs> yeah, dick like, you know, yeah, it, it was just a bit like, <laughs> It was just a like a giggle, wasn't it? Have a giggle with it, man. But he takes stuff so personal that he's telling me how much money he's made, and he was saying, uh, "What did he say?" He said um, something along the lines of, "Of uh, he's been a champion all around the world, and he's made one million. I've not made nowhere near how much he's made, and uh, I don't even know what it's like to be a father and all this shit. Like just." Stuff that you could go personal with, and you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. And then you'll block me. 
They'll send me a long, long ass message and then block me. But it's ridiculous, mate. It's child. Then he'll unblock me and send me another message. It's so childish. But um, I just said whatever in it, like, and I, I, when I see you, I will talk to you. I saw him. I went over there, and I, I was I was very mindful of where I was. There was kids around. I wasn't ever never mm-hmm. gonna go over there and start swinging punches and all that sort of stuff. But you know what? I confronted the guy. I confronted him, and I tickled his beard. And that was that. <laughs> I win. I wait, win. wait. So, so what? When you confronted him at the expo, and we saw a video, did he DM you after that? Did he try and contact you after that? Say anything nah. like, "Hey, I'm in your neck of the woods," or is that the last time you kind of heard from him and saw him? No, nah, that was the last time I saw him. No, nah. he's uh-huh. not going to say anything again. What? What he, did you? He, what? I was going to say, what? What did you see in his eyes when you sort of approached him at the expo? And went up to him and touched his. So you touched his beard, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I tickled his beard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they showed that in the video. I didn't. I didn't even realize that. Yeah, I tickled his beard. So <laughs> when I got there, I think the first thing was he was was shocked. He wasn't expecting me to be there. I don't think he was expecting me to be there. And then to see me, and then he's trying. You see, he's trying. I'm loud. I'm quite loud. And what I'm saying is just the truth. I'm not going there starting shit saying you're a bad guy when he's a good guy. It's like, you know, I'm not going to go up to, up to, um, uh, I don't know, to, uh, GSP and start saying, GSP, you're such a bad guy. You're a, like, but people, no one's going to believe that. It's not true. He seems like a nice guy. He seems like a lovely guy anyway. And he portrayed himself the right way. Mm. But everyone knows his track record he's probably going to be some truth in what I'm saying. So I was just, I just was being funny with it. I just said, you know, how much are they paying you to pretend to be a nice guy? And you could see he was trying to mask it and cover it up mm. by clapping and just being loud. Hey guys. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's give this guy a round of applause uh, to try and quieten me down, you know, mm. but it wasn't working. And then, and then he said something, what did he say? He said, let don't, don't hold him back or, Something like mm-hmm. that. Don't hold him back. And I thought, well, don't come that close to me and expect me not to touch me. That's silly. <laughs> and because there was kids around, there was there was a uh, um, there, there was a lot of young kids around, and that's their they you know they're idle. They're looking up to this guy. I don't want to ruin it for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I couldn't let him get that close and not grab his beard. There was no <laughs> way. There was no way. And I knew the minute I did that, <laughs> the minute I did that, his face changed and he looked pissed. <laughs> he looked pissed and I was like there you go I just won I just won again <laughs> <laughs> wow he's there you little, go mate, he's, you know, he's an insecure guy uh, he's really insecure you read you know what maybe one day I'll show you these messages but he's really insecure he's not confident in himself regardless of what he's got and what he's accomplished he, he's, he's an insecure person and I guess that makes him a bad person I don't know because he, he's, he's he's really not got a good soul He's not got a good soul, you know. I don't know how he how he's able to to, um, or maybe he's not able to sleep. I don't know, but he he doesn't seem to have a very good soul, man. You look in that guy's eyes. I don't see good. I definitely don't see good. Tell you what, man. It'll it'll definitely be interesting. You know, hopefully one day we see you in the UFC. Hopefully one day very soon. And if John Jones moves up to heavyweight and you're in that heavyweight division, it's going to make for some interesting times. Just quickly, as we let you go, and by the way, really, really, really appreciate the time and the stories, Chai. Could, we could chat to of you course. all day. Um, you're when, when, when do you think you'll be fighting next, man? Is, is there another fight sort of around the corner soon? We imagine injury-free after this one, right? Oh, I don't know, man. I've bent a nail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have anything booked yet, but uh, obviously talks are always ongoing, and... Um, I like to keep myself available for, for options. So we'll just see what's happening, man. I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm just enjoying, I mean, I'm enjoying being alive right now. I'm just having fun mm. and, um, an opportunity comes, I'll take it, you know, but I'm not going to hang up my, my, um, my concerns and, and be like, Oh man, what's going on? Let's do this. Let's do it. I'm like, right, cool. It happens. It happens. And I feel like I enjoy myself a lot more that way, you know? Well, there you go, man. Guys, follow the man on Twitter and Instagram at chopper underscore chai. We noticed you haven't posted on Twitter in a while, Chai. So hopefully, hopefully there'll be some cheeky new posts. I think the last one is you doing some uh, some sexy gyrating, I believe, for one of your sponsors. So obviously, keep up the excellent work, and uh, we look we look forward to your next fight, man. Hopefully, this all gets sorted out, and we'll be seeing you in either the UFC or Bellator, one of the big promotions. Really appreciate the time, man. Thanks for chatting with us. 
You're more than welcome. Have a, have a fantastic rest of your day, and thank you. Hey, this is Tony Okagui Ferguson, and you guys are listening to Submission Radio. Keep tuning in, guys. All right, guys, this is a special treat. Our next guest is a longtime friend of the program. You know him from being one half of one of the greatest MMA gyms of all time, working with fighters such as Carlos Condor, John Jones, Holly Holm, Michelle Watterson, and the list goes on and on. After a busy weekend, he joins us here on the program. It's a pleasure to welcome Coach Mike Winkle, John, back to Submission Radio. Coach, it's great to have you on the program. Hey, gentlemen, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure having you on. And and what a crazy weekend it would have been for you. UFC 239 officially in the books. A lot of your fighters obviously on the card. You know, I, I imagine a roller coaster of emotions. What What is it like coming down from a week like this or, or, or a weekend like this, I should say, you know, just, just a few days later after the event for you? Oh, you know what? It's, uh, it's, uh, there's no doubt there was a little bit of a pressure going on having Holly and John both there, the, you know, the main yep. event and the co-main event. But, uh, um, you know what, uh, um, it's over with, we go forward with it. You know, we had, we came out 50% on that one. John looked okay. Uh, you know, Tiago throws bombs. So he had to play it safe in many ways and beat him at his own game. But, and Holly, uh, we made a mistake. Shit happens. But, uh, mark my words that that lady will be back. She's as tough as anybody out there. Mm-hmm. We want to talk about those guys in just a second. Just quickly, before we get to them, I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts, Coach, on Diego Sanchez, because he said during fight week that apparently he left uh, Jackson Wink three weeks before his fight last weekend. And it kind of shocked a lot of people because he's been with you guys for so long. So I'm just wondering, from your perspective, what exactly happened with Diego? You know what? I just tell everybody, uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Uh, mm. um, Diego just stopped wanting to show up. But uh, with that being said, uh, he's always more than welcome here. He's just on vacation. I think he's going through some tough times in his life and uh, mm. making some, some crazy decisions. And, uh, you know, he's done so much around here over the years that uh, um, what he's saying out of emotion sometimes, people have to take that with a grain of salt and just understand that, uh, you know, we we're always going to care for that guy. He's done a lot of things for a lot of people over and above uh, just fighters, just kids with special needs here. He's got a big heart. And so, you know, in, in the back seat, we're always on uh, Team Diego. Mm-hmm. So just, just to follow that one up, I mean, he mentioned during fight week that he wasn't feeling the love. So just to confirm, he's welcome to come back to the team. And there's love definitely there from Coach Wink and the, and the boys. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, it's... Uh, it's, it's important to us to, to, to keep training. We've been with him for a long time. He was on a two-win fight streak. Um, he just wanted to change things up. Some people get in his hair. I have no idea what that new coach told him. But uh, anyway, all I know is he's more than welcome to come back. Um, any, any th- what was it like watching his fight there? Were you sort of, I guess now that he's sort of not officially at Jackson Wink, when you watch him fight, are you sort of watching with, with vested eyes? Is, is it the same watching it for you? Or do you sort of focus on, you know, I, I guess your fighters, Holly and John, when they're coming up in the night? You know, I was just uh, honestly, with what his coach was showing him, I just didn't want him to get hurt. Um, but with that being said, he still grinded like Diego has done for years with us. And, uh, you know, he's Diego Sanchez. Uh, I really wish he would have been in with a team, training with a lot of guys and pushed himself. Um, and being in better condition to explode in different places. But I wasn't able to watch a lot of it. I was wrapping hands that time, and I just had to focus on the two fighters I had on the card. Mm-hmm. All right, well, let's talk about uh, one of the fighters that you mentioned um, had a bit of a tougher time. And I know you got a great relationship with Holly Holm. You guys have been uh, working together for a really, really long time. She lost to Amanda Nunes. Just give us your thoughts on how this fight played out. It was a bit of a tough evening for Holly. Uh, you know what? Uh, it played out at the beginning just like I thought it was. There's no doubt Amanda was looking to counter Holly because she has a tendency to, to rush in. Uh, so Holly knew that. She changed that up a little bit. They were able to pressure Amanda back. Um, but there's not a lot to be said. And then she started to throw a kick. She put it down. She had done something similar earlier in the fight. Um, and she didn't throw a kick. So she, she, she paid for it in a major way. Um, and back to drawing board. It's just there's there's nothing to be said. It's just everybody everybody knows exactly what happened. She, um, for some reason, whether she thought um, Amanda juked her there a little bit and was stopping and starting, I'm not sure. But for some reason, she didn't throw the kick, and um, like I said, she paid for it. 
What do you think about the discussion post fight? Because I think the narrative was sort of, you know, people wondering whether Holly would come back and Dana White at the post fight press conference was speaking about how he never, he didn't really say he wanted her to retire, but he kind of went on this, you know, tangent about how he cares for her so much. And he, he kind of alluded to maybe her, her, you know, that he thinks she should retire. What did you think of sort of that narrative when you heard that? Well, I didn't really actually listen to it. I heard things about it, you know, yeah. about the narrative. But uh, I honestly believe Dana probably does care. Uh, um, as crazy that is in, 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 this, in this sport where they just kind of feed these guys to each other, I think mm-hmm. sometimes he, he notices, you know, people with great hearts like Holly, and, and he does care. But with that being said, you know, when Holly got knocked out last time in a world title fight in boxing against uh, Anne Sophie Mac- Matisse, mm-hmm. um, everybody said, you got to retire, you got to retire. She says, nope, I'm getting a rematch. Mm-hmm. And she went and beat the girl up in her and, and, and after that, she, she got the MMA. So um, I just know Holly, and I had a discussion with her today. We reviewed the film. Um, she's going to take a little trip, and, and uh, her life sucks right now. She says she, she woke up to live in a nightmare every every morning when she wakes up now since the fight. Wow. But with that being said, uh, yeah, all, all I know is Holly is who she is. She uh, She's a fighter. She's the exact opposite of what Ronda Rousey did. She got knocked out by Holly, who her whole life was over. Um, Holly comes from she's she's made from a different mold. She will uh, get back up on her horse and start riding again. Well, yeah, it's it's a fascinating comparison, and I was going to say that's that's good news for the Holly Holm fans, right? She confirmed to you that she she will come back. She confirmed to you that she's she's not going to retire or anything like that, right? Absolutely confirmed it. Mm. I'm just I'm just wondering, coach, as well. I mean, when you look at uh, what's left for her to accomplish. Would you say, because of the way that she lost at UFC 239, her motivation is to come back after that, and that would sort of be her goal to come back after a loss like that, but and possibly, what, what is the goal? To rematch Amanda Nunes, or just sort of talk to us, what do, you, what do you guys sort of have your eyes set on? Because she's accomplished so much, she's won the title, she, she's won a bunch of titles in boxing, is it, is it just to come back from a loss like that? And sort of show people, you know, what she can do, or what, just talk us through mentally what what sort of the goals are for her at this point. There's no doubt, Holly wants it all. Her her, her sight still are setting the goals, so we know we have to, you know, start back down a little bit and, and work our way back up and uh, not make those mistakes. Time for uh, a few changes, but with that being said, uh, um, just hesitated. And it's happened to a lot of people. It's kind of like throwing a jab and then decide not to and drop them to your waist and get punched in the face. It happens. Um, and uh, um, Amanda is just fantastic what she does. And all the credit to Amanda. She was not only an incredible fighter, but what a what a, what a sportswoman after the fight. I, mm. She came and talked to me back in the locker room. And, and she's an incredible individual. And I really appreciate how down to earth she is. And she's got, she's got a big heart. What, what, what did mm-hmm. she say when she saw you in the locker room? Just that, you know, about how much the respect she has for Holly and, and uh, you know, that's the sport. It has nothing to do with you know, personal feelings or anything like that and how much she respects the team. And she just had the right right things to say versus some people that, uh, you know, have antics after they win. And because she could have played it the other way, but uh, um, she became a great role model in my mind when she said the things she said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. An incredible run she's had as well. Let's talk about the main event because John Jones, like you mentioned, had a had a sort of close fight with Santos, but before we get into the actual fight, we saw that John Jones tweeted out uh, yesterday that apparently Luke Rockhold was talking a bit of trash to him after the weigh-ins during fight week. I'm just wondering, is that true? Were you there when that went down? You know, I actually wasn't there, but I heard about it, so I believe mm. it to be true. Mm. What, what, do, what, do you know what sort what of went down? What, what, yeah, what did Luke say? Did he mention to you? You know, I no, I don't. I don't have any details other than just talking trash and piss John off. And so John was like, "Hey, I hope he wins so I can get his ass down the road." What What did mm. you think when you saw him go down earlier in the night? It's a pretty tough loss for Luke, and I think that's a fight that I think a lot of people were kind of looking forward to, in, in, including ourselves. You know what? Uh, I didn't talk to John about that. At that point in time, John's getting focused on his fight. What people don't understand about John is he's so mental, uh, mentally strong about focusing on his fight. He's able to uh, compartmentalize things. He's like, that's, that's later. I'll deal with that shit later. And I need to get focused on what I need to do right now. And uh, so I, I didn't get a reaction out of him when that happened. Um, he, was, he was warming up, and he just kept kept warming up. No expression changed at all. 
Mm -hmm. From your perspective as a coach, obviously Luke Rockhold, you know, former champion, a guy with su su such a strong skill set, you know, great on the ground. He's achieved quite a lot of stuff. What, what did you think when you, when you saw the way the fight played out? A lot of people are sort of talking about that at 34 years young, you know, it may be time for him to retire. What are your thoughts about what you saw from him? You know, same thing. You know, again, like I say, I wasn't able to watch the whole fight because I'm in the back wrapping hands and getting people ready for the fight. But from what I saw, you know, he's, he's still there. You know, people make mistakes. And everybody is the Sunday, um, you know, coach. And, and, oh, he shouldn't have or she shouldn't have. Um, try, try building them and, and having that game plan from the, from the beginning. That's, that's where you're a coach. Everybody afterwards is always, you know, second guess and then saying what people should do after the fact. But uh, mm. I think Luke Rockhold's got skills and, and he's capable of doing whatever he wants to do you know i i think he he could be smart enough well he is smart enough to do anything in this world um like a lot of these fighters you know, they, they don't want to fight fighting is almost stupid as it is but uh, it's important to us you know and what we do but he's capable of so many things and i, I think he definitely is capable of still fighting because mm -hmm. well, when i look at uh luke it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of alistair overeem and what you guys did with alistair when he mm. went over to jackson winkle john um, you know, obviously Alistair would throw, you know, power shots and he'd sort of keep his chin out there. And you guys created a game plan for him that, you know, almost led him to the title. Do you think just with a couple of changes in the right coaching, you know, a guy like Luke Rockhold could still have a bit of a run in the, in the division? I think so. I don't think it's the coaches. And it could be. I mean, sometimes sometimes just need to make a change because he could have a coach that tells him the same thing over and over and over and then somebody else tells him the same thing, but in a different way, and he listens. Uh, but he's got some great coaches, so I don't think it's coaches at all. I think sometimes everybody has their own internal, uh, internal demons and they can do things or not do things in fights. That's what happened with Holly, I believe. Um, I think, like I said, I think uh, um, it's just a fight. It's just a fight game. Shit happens. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, onto something positive. Obviously, John Jones got the big win over Tiago Santos and, and retained the belt. Um, a lot closer than a lot of people expected, though. People thought he was going to sort of bulldoze through Tiago Santos. What did you make of the fight, Coach? Um, Tiago can throw punches. Let me tell you what. Mm. That guy throws so hard. He is so damn scary that uh, um, John John decided he was just going to beat him up at, at kicking range for the most part, kicking range and elbow range. There was no need to be in that boxing range with the guy. That, that's how he wins. Um, with that being said, John went to beat him at his own game, and uh, God bless John Jones. Um, he should have and maybe could have taken him down, but nope. Instead, he wanted to beat the stand-up kickboxer guy at stand-up kickboxing, and that's what John Jones did. He proved it. If they had a rematch, I promise you John could take him down in the first round uh, and, and change that game. Just John, John's just uh, he's just a different animal out there. He, he, he likes to, to prove a point. He did the same thing with Glover. Um, a long time mm. ago, way mm. back, and, and um, I believe in John Jones. I think uh, I, I, I often thought we had four rounds. I have no idea what the one judge was thinking, but uh, with that being said, I, I guess I get emotionally attached. As coaching staff, I'm wondering, like, if, if this rematch were to happen somewhere down the line, would you insist to John Jones and say, look, man, you need to take this guy down and, you know, put the fight more in, in your favor? Or would you sort of say to him, look, if you, if you feel confident, you know, you have the skills to stand stand on the face. I'm, I'm always wondering, like, from a coach's perspective, do you try mm. and limit that risk? Or is there that fine line where you believe in your fighter so much that you sort of... And I, and I guess, at the end of the day, John Jones is going to do whatever he wants to do while he's in that cage, right? Yeah, for the most part. We have a little influence on him, but uh, um, he does a lot. He... he uh, He's like when he decides he wants to stay standing up, though he is like a video game for his coaches, uh, for myself and Brandon Gibson, uh, uh, all of us, and Aaron even involved um, from the outside in, in training. Is he he listens to his coaches and he will fire a technique that we call out almost immediately. It, it's it's quite amazing. Um, but the overall strategy sometimes he might want to change it. Uh, but uh, um, I think in the rematch, John would probably take him down right away without us telling him, just because it's the easiest path path to victory. He's already proved what he wanted to prove. Mm. I'm wondering, Coach, did you guys see Tiago hurt his knee during the fight? Because in the post-fight press conference, uh, John seemed a little bit oblivious to the fact that Tiago had a hurt knee in the fight. Uh, yeah, we knew his legs were hurt. Um, I wasn't sure if it was his knee or what was going on because he's, he's limping on it. There's a couple things that happened. 
a couple of John's kicks to the legs, I, I know had had a good impact and good trauma, caused some good damage to his legs. But he checked one of his right leg roundhouses that just shut him down. Um, so the combination of all that, I think uh, Tiago was hurt in many different places. And uh, I think the knee being messed up a little bit, uh, um, you know, played out. He had a hard time supporting his weight on it, and uh, and, and nor did he want to get kicked in there. Mm. I'm curious because the, it came out that now that his knee was just completely wrecked. Everything was pretty much torn up in there. It was absolutely destroyed. In a lot of ways, that actually makes a fighter more dangerous because he was in there sorry, knowing yeah, that. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say um, the, the news came out that his knee was absolutely destroyed. Everything's pretty much torn up in there. And it kind of goes two ways. On one side, you know, he was hurt. On the other side, he had nothing to lose. And that almost makes him a little bit more dangerous. But what, what, what's your perspective on what Tiago was able to do now that the news came out that he, his knee was just absolutely destroyed in that fight? Well, it just tells you who he is. And they didn't get paid enough money, probably. You know what? He's as tough as they come. He throws down. He's a warrior, and there's nothing but respect from our camp, you know, for, for he and his team because, uh, you know, to persevere through that is incredible. I mean, John himself, you know, his, his legs were trashed a little bit. His leg was hurt, hurt, but that's what John Jones does. He pushes through. He decides, I'm still going to win, you know, doing doing this game plan even though I'm hurting. And uh, these guys are at a high level, and, and nothing but respect for their abilities to push through pain. Mm. Just quickly on that, was John Jones coming into the fight with an injury, or do you mean he hurt his uh, he hurt his foot in, in during the fight? Oh, you know what? Uh, um, he's had he's had many injuries during during training, but uh, mm. you know nothing, nothing major. But those little owies, you hit him again <laughs> in the fight, and all of a sudden you're like, ow, even a bigger <laughs> out. You know, you don't want to say that out loud. Uh, but now the swelling comes up that much more. And, and, and he, got, he got some injuries in the fight. But you know what? That happens every fight. Um, like I said, it's, uh, sometimes you do it to yourself when you kick. Sometimes you do it when they kick you. And uh, um, all I can do is take my hats off to Tiago because uh, he's a leg-kicking machine. And uh, he, he throws so many hard shots that, you know, it, it was scary sometimes. He's, uh, he's much better than the odds makers, odds makers put out. Yeah, I think Tiago won a lot of people's respect that night. What, what do you think – this kind of performance sort of does for John mentally against moving forward into his next fight because post fight he was kind of talking about how he might have been drinking his own Kool Aid. It it almost seems like maybe it's lit a fire under John Jones, sort of you know having having that split decision, which I know I know a lot of people think the split decision was a bit ridiculous to begin with, but I get the sense that John's the kind of guy who in the next fight he he it'll be he'll be even more motivated to not let that happen, right? Well, we've been at something similar before, um, although not, I think it was worse. But Gustin, Gustin yeah. won, you know, that, that did a lot of fire on his ass to actually start training hard again. Um, and you saw how he destroyed Gustin the next time they fought. Um, but he trained hard for this fight. It's just, honestly, it's just, I believe it's just a style thing. John mm -hmm. wanted to win that way. And when you have somebody throwing bombs, why would you want to exchange with them? John played it smart. He went right into elbow range and he dropped him with an elbow. Um, and that, that was a great thing. So it was all about being at that range where Tiago wasn't so dangerous. Very smart move. You know, some people, the, the fans want to see the brawl, but honestly, is it worth brain damage to make the fans happy? I don't think so. Mm. I actually found it more interesting just seeing the way John handled Tiago striking. So I think a lot of people still found the fight absolutely fascinating. Now let's talk about someone that wasn't very impressed with John Coach, and that was Israel Adesanya. He was on Ariel Hawani's show this week and said Jones looked old and his performance was meh. He said he, he watched him live in the crowd, and it sort of put things into perspective for him. What, what do you think about Israel's criticisms? Uh, you know, he's trying to make money. You know, good for him. That's what he's trying to do is trying to put a fight together down the road. And uh, I'm sure John will be more than happy to accommodate him down the road when he finally gets enough size. How, how do you think that fight plays out and how much of a factor do you think the size would be? Let's say hypothetically Israel was to put on a bit of extra size to go up to light heavyweight. How do you think they match up stylistically? Gosh, it's, it's down the road. He has to put some weight on. We'll have to see how he performs that weight. If he has the same speed, the same explosives he has right now. He's a fantastic fighter. He, he's incredible what he does. Um, you know, John, John, John beats him in so many avenues. Um, and as far as the speed kickboxing wise, you know, Israel, that's what he does. But uh, John, John can go with anybody standing up in the world. But John always can take you down and then rain elbows on your face. And that's what takes John Jones and separates him from the rest of the pack.
I, I was going to say it's interesting because a lot of people would look at it and say, yeah, John could probably take Israel down. But kind of like we saw with Thiago Santos, do you think that John Jones would probably rather stand with Israel and potentially beat him at his own game if they ever fought? Well, that's for us to know, and you guys to find out. So not even for the coach to find out. Mm-hmm. I mean, Israel plans yeah. on. Sorry, sorry, gone, coach. I said, you never know what's what's going on uh, behind the scenes with what John's thinking. He could change it up on us, even. But uh, um, no, I would never reveal a game plan. There's there's different things about Israel that we that we've seen that about Washington so far that uh, um, leave holes. Everybody's got holes. John's got holes. Everybody does. Mm. It's funny, actually, coach, because we were talking to Israel's coach, uh, Eugene Barrowman. He has a gym over there in New Zealand called City Kickboxing. And they've actually been working on a game plan to beat John Jones ever since sort of Israel texted him a little while ago. They believe they might hold the key to beating John Jones. What do you think about them strategizing and thinking of game plans this far out from the fight on how to beat John Jones? That's a compliment. I, 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 I... Our team would take that as a compliment that what we've done is made somebody years ahead of time just start looking to, to climb to the top of the mountain. So there's no doubt everybody's trying to pick John Jones off. He's at the top. He's definitely got a target on his head. Uh, but good luck. Mm. I'm just w- wondering as well, well, we're talking about people trying to challenge John Jones. We actually had the middleweight champion, Robert Whitaker, on the program. This was a few weeks ago, Coach. And he was actually he actually expressed his desire to fight John Jones on our program if things work out with Israel Adesanya. I'm just wondering, do you think that a, a champion like Robert Whitaker, someone who's incredibly tough, but of course is still a middleweight, can be someone that can give John a challenge? In your opinion? Oh, absolutely. You know, both those gentlemen are are so good. You know, you don't become the champ without being having a great skill set. Um, he's very explosive. He's very crafty what he does, and he's got many, many skills that could hit anybody in the world. Um, he just, I know he trains hard, and from what I, I've been nothing but impressed with him so far. So, you know, I'm not, they're, they're all scary fights for John Jones. Every one of them we have to take serious. But uh, when John's on top, I don't think anybody beats John Jones but himself. Just And just quickly, Coach, as we look towards that Robert Whitaker israel Adesanya fight, I know you don't coach them, and they're possibly not really guys that you watch too often, but when you look at that matchup, who do you predict wins that one? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. You know it it is a tough um, one, yeah. I, mean, I, 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 wouldn't, I can't even take it. I, if I sat down and watched some film you know, overnight, I'd be able to get back to you guys. But, uh, okay, well, you, you, you text me. You text me. We want to put it out. <laughs> we want to be the first ones to get the, Jack, <laughs> the Coach Wink perspective on it. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Just, just quickly, yeah, we'll, yeah, for a yeah we'll, we'll, we'll let you go in a moment, Wink. Really appreciate the time. Just sort of finishing up on John Jones, everyone's already wondering what's next. You know, he's expressed desire to fight potentially in December. And people are saying, look, if, if DC beats Stipe Miocic in August, maybe that's a fight that could happen. I, You know, it, John Jones kind of seems like he would rather DC come down to 205, DC sort of would like to come down to 205. I think a lot of the fans would like to see that fight at heavyweight. We kind of get the sense that in, in, in a lot of ways, it come down, comes down to money, that if the UFC would be willing to pay John Jones you know, the extra money, he would be willing to go up to heavyweight. Is, is that the case? Would John Jones be willing to fight DC at heavyweight if the UFC were to sort of pony up and, and make it worth his while? You know, we haven't talked any specifics about it. You know, I know John... Uh is for the money, he'll go beat up Daniel Cormier again. Uh, there's no doubt about it, whether it be heavyweight or light heavyweight. Um, we would just, heavyweight's one of those things that just takes a little bit of time to, to grow into that weight. Um, John does not have a hard time making 205. In fact, it was very, very easy for him, this this, this camp. I won't lie, his weight cut was playing basketball, um, which so was not hard at all. Hmm. So that tells you how much weight we, we would want to put on for heavyweight because, you know, Daniel Cormier is, when he's at heavyweight, I think, you know, he's very explosive. Not that John Jones wouldn't be able to hit that much harder as well. But uh, um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. It's about money and motivation and time. Do, do you think it's an increased risk? Because uh, I, I believe I've heard John Jones speak about how it is an increased risk if he goes up to heavyweight. And he does kind of give Daniel Cormier an advantage, uh, you know, to not have to cut that extra weight. I think Daniel uh, um, is probably a better fighter at heavyweight than he is a light heavyweight a little bit. I do believe that. But with that being said, that doesn't mean John Jones is not a better fighter at heavyweight than he is a light heavyweight as well. Mm. Um, you know, people haven't seen John John, John gain weight and, and go after it that way too. So John's, John's still growing. You know, he's, uh, 
he's putting weight on. So not growing tall wise, but uh, his body's filling out. And, uh, you know, now he's hit the 30 and uh, we'll see what happens. What, what do you think is more likely? John Jones at, at heavyweight in December or John Jones, uh, you know, staying at 205 and, and, and defending the belt? I guess that could still be against Daniel Cormier potentially. But um, I think I think based on what you said, it seems like he's not really going to go to heavyweight anytime too soon. Yeah, if I was if I was a betting man, I'd say stay at two hundred five. Mm. But uh, you never know. Like I said, it's all about motivation and money. I'll tell you what, coach. It's exciting times right now for John Jones and a lot of the fighters at Jackson Wink. We appreciate your time, of course, guys. Make sure to follow Coach Wink on Twitter at MMA Coach Wink and visit JacksonWink.com for information and everything that's happening at the gym. Of course. A lot of fantastic programs. You don't have to be a professional fighter to enjoy some of the fun things that happen at the gym. And make sure to check out some of the cool opportunities there. That's jacksonwink.com. Coach, thank you so much for joining us on the program. We can't wait to see what happens next. And it's always a pleasure having you here. All right, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Thank you so thanks, much, Mike. Have fun down there. Bye. This is Chael Sonnen, and you are listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest is unofficially the pound-for-pound nicest guy in MMA, the real-life Karate Kid, and a former two-time UFC title challenger with a highlight reel of knockouts on his resume. He returns to Submission Radio. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, welcome back to the program. How are you, man? Oh, man, feeling great. Uh, In the process of moving into our new gym, so uh, sorry about that, guys, by the way. But, man, we're we're hanging out, man, having a good time, Uh, healing up from that last fight of mine, obviously. But uh, ready to get back out there, and I mentioned at the bits uh, to do it again, get out there in the octagon. So, uh, feeling good. Mm, absolutely, and you're a bit of a man of travel because we saw you were in the Bahamas. Now you're coming mm. off a crazy international fight week in Vegas. We saw you were there at the UFC Fan Expo. What was that like for you, man? Any memorable experiences? We imagine you'd be one of the guys where fans would feel more comfortable to say the more crazier things or to do the more crazier things when they meet you because you're so nice. <laughs> well, you know what? Like, you know, meeting the fans is always, you know, my, my, my favorite part of International Fight Week. You know, this is why we do what we do, to, to meet new people, to make, fan, uh, make fans and friends. Uh, it was awesome. But, you know, it wasn't too, too crazy. Um, I had somebody ask me to kick him in the face. but I was <laughs> Really? Not- Obviously, Did you do it? Oh, yeah. I get that all the time. I don't know why. Like, people are like, dude, just kick me in the face one time, Steve. I'm like, oh bro, I'm not kicking you in the face. You know what I mean? Like, I could I could definitely, you know, be harmful to you. Like, it's <laughs> not good to yeah. get kicked in the face. Yeah. But, yeah, man, people ask me to do that to them all the time. It's crazy. I don't know why. These people must be people who have never seen your highlight reel. That's the only way that anyone would <laughs> ask to be kicked in the face by yourself. Um, we, we know we don't have a lot of time with you, Steven. So obviously the, there's a lot to discuss here. You're there, UFC 239. Got to ask you, seeing as it is your division, what did you think about Jorge Masvidal's crazy knockout over Ben Askren? T- talk about a shot to the face there, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah, man. Me, I'm sitting there next to my brother and Chris Weidman and a bunch of other fighters, you know? And it was just, it was one of those like, you know, do, did I just believe, did I just see that? Like what in the heck just happened? And I mean, the, the whole crowd, and I, I loved watching the YouTube, uh, you know, clip of Joe Rogan and those guys sitting cage. I don't know if y'all seen it yet, but they go crazy. And you hear the crowd behind them. Obviously I'm, I'm one of the crowd going crazy, but it was just, nobody expected that. And what's even crazier is that he planned for that. Like that wasn't a fluke thing. Mm. Like he knew what he was doing. I don't know if you saw the clip of him actually practicing mm. that in the cage or not. Did y'all see that? Yeah. 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 I mean, he knew what he was doing. You know what I mean? He, he came out there. I mean, uh, he's done a lot of studying. Obviously, George Masvidal is a very intelligent guy. Me facing him, I think it was a year and a half ago, two years maybe. Mm-hmm. I, I fought uh, George Masvidal at, G, at uh, MSG. Mm-hmm. But he's a very smart guy. He's got good a good crew around him. So he knows that, you know, Ben Askren walks forward. And he shoots. He walks forward and he shoots. He walks forward and he shoots. And when he ran out there, nobody expected it. I don't, ben didn't even expect it. You know, if you go back and watch, he kind of ducked his head and was like, oh, my God, I, I pray to, you know, I'm, I'm going to get this. <laughs> it was so fast. It was probably just a reaction for him, you know. Um, and, you know, we've all been there. Uh, I was there my last fight getting knocked out and not really knowing, you know, how the, how it happened. So, Man, and my hats off to Mars Vidal and even even Ben Askren because the way he took that as well after the fight, he was on 
uh, a few, uh, you know, shows, you know, discussing the fight and things like that, man. He's a, he's, he's, you know, he's a warrior, man. He is definitely a warrior. Well, I'm just curious. What did you think of Jorge's post-fight celebration? Um, I think people were kind of divided. I think a lot of people kind of thought, you know what, there was so much, there was so much talk between these guys. It's understandable. Some people thought, oh, you know, maybe Jorge shouldn't have done that. You're probably one of the nicest guys in, in the sport. What did you think of that? Well, you know, to me, I'm definitely not the guy to talk trash, number one. That's just not who I am. But two, you know, you do go out there and, and you talk a lot of trash and then you get put to sleep. It's kind of embarrassing, right? Mm. But then again, Ben Askren knows how to play the game. He knows how to sell a fight. So you know that's coming. That's going to happen. Like Conor McGregor. No matter who he fights, he be the nice guy in the world. He's going to talk some trash. He's going to build a fight, and, and he's going to try and get under your skin. But that said, Ben Askren, I think, also knows what kind of a man George Masvidal is. George doesn't play that game. Mm. He, he, I, I think he takes it, you know, to another level. Uh, even when he fought, um, you know, Darren Till, it was, it was. I think with guys like that, he, he, he works really hard he works really hard trains harder i don't know his mindset's different because he wants to go out there and he wants to hurt you you know the guys that talk the trash that do like you know that, that do that he's he's like he's almost like a like kind of that diaz mentality like he's yeah. just an og man that's the way he is he's not faking it if he says he doesn't like you he really doesn't freaking like you if he's gonna talk trash he means it he's not just hyping the fight up he means it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's just the kind of guy G uh, George is. And, you know, to be honest with you, I, I, I respect I respect Ben Askren. I like the way that he does that. He he does hype the fight up. But also, you got to respect George Masvidal because, you know, he's a freaking OG. That's just who he is. Like, he don't play that game. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, you know, people talk trash to me, I'm just like, ah, I know what you're trying to do. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, it doesn't bother me. George is like, I'm going to hurt you, bro. <laughs> and, I it, and I mean it. You know, so, um, you know, I, it was just, I, I expected, I expected uh, a different fight in that I thought it was going to go all three rounds. I, I knew that, and I told everybody this from day one, when that fight happened, don't underestimate George Masvidal. I faced him. He's, he's, he's a scrambler. He's good. He went three rounds uh and not i don't think he got i don't think he got submitted by uh maya right he didn't get submitted, no he didn't but it went all three rounds um so he's very good off of his back you know he's crafty he scrambles he gets back up to his feet i mean obviously ben Askren's just a monster of a wrestler i mean would ben out scramble him i don't think so but uh you know he is he does one of his best friends and sparring partners i believe is colby covington one of the one of the you know one of those grinders and good wrestlers in the UFC. So he's got great sparring partners. I thought it was going to be a crazy fight. I didn't know it was going to go that way. So, Stephen, I mean, you mentioned it. The, the welterweight division right now is absolutely, you could say it, it's hottest and the hottest it's been in quite some time. I mean, you're sitting there. Uh, obviously, you have that loss against Anthony Pettis, but you have a win over a guy like Masvidal. So sitting there, what does it do to you to see a guy that you've beaten possibly you know kind of be like one of the hottest guys in the division right now does it sort of give you a feeling like hey i got a win over this guy this is the hottest guy in the division this could be my opportunity to possibly even rematch him down the line now that he's really built a name for himself oh 100 percent. i mean 100 percent. watching him go out there and do his thing knowing that I've, i i've defeated him um definitely puts a smile on my face you know what i mean i like to see him you know a guy that i've already beat do well um, mm. but, uh, at the same time, like, yeah, I could be facing this guy again in the future. Not only that, but a guy that came over, came off of a loss and, and he's, he's made some spectacular knockout, spectacular wins, you know, after a guy losing and seeing him come back like that is always one of those like inspirational type deals, you know? So I'm kind of in that boat. I'm, I've, I've won one of my last, what, four fights maybe. So it's like, you know, I, I I know I'm better than what my last fight showed. You know, I was out there beating him and I just got caught, but I know I'm better than that. And I and I to be honest, that last fight has really lit a fire in me. Um, just to get back out there and put on a show and and train as hard as I can and you know, because 
for a while there, you you get to the point where training is just is you're just training because you know I've been doing it my whole life. I've been fighting since I was 15, and training just be it just becomes training. You don't have that like that like uh, I don't know like that like that like that that flame. You know what I mean? That flame that's like you know I'm gonna beat the shit out of this guy next time. The next guy I fight, mm. and I just I had that feeling again, man. and. Uh, and I think it's because I've never been knocked out before, and it happened. So I want to come back just just better than ever, better than ever, you know? And there's no reason why, and it still kind of gets me to this day, like, why did I not see that punch coming? Why, why you know, normally I see that. I, normally I see all of that. Why didn't I see that coming, you know? And I like to tell myself it was because I was a little bit more square than usual, but that's just an excuse. So I should have been in good position. I shouldn't have been out of position. And that's my fault. And I know I'm better than that. So mm-hmm. I want to show everybody I'm better than that. So, yeah, man, I see a guy like George off, you know, come from a loss for me, come back and smoke and his last two dudes. It's super inspirational. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I know what you mean because you mentioned it like the fire is lit and you mentioned the fact that there's so much going on in the division. Do you think a part of it also has to do with the fact that for a long time, everybody always spoke about how you'd be the next champion, how you're one of the best guys in the division. But then after you lost the fight with Anthony, you know, it kind of seems like in a lot of ways, people aren't bringing up Stephen Thompson in the division as much. Like they're talking about Ben Askren, they're talking about Kobe Covington. It's like, it seems like a lot of fans have sort of written you off and were like, well, Stephen Thompson had his run and now he's going to 36 or 37 and he had his turn at the title. Is that something that kind of gives you extra motivation to show them, hey, I'm still here and this Anthony Pettis thing, you know, this Darren Till thing, all these losses, this isn't where it's going to finish? Oh, uh, you know what? It's really not so much that, uh, it, you know, for me, it's like I don't consider myself uh, – uh, you know, a 36 year old. Like, I don't feel, I don't feel it. I don't feel yeah. the age. I don't feel, I feel like I'm 20 freaking five, to be honest with you. So it's not really much my age, but it's, it is the fact that, hey, when you're not winning, people forget about you, man. If you're not in the, and if you're not in people's eyes, like I saw with Masvidal, like his knockout with, uh, you know, Darren Till. And now this knockout that he has against Ben Askren, like he's blowing up. Like, you know, it's like, what the heck? Um, his fan base has gotten really big, which is cool. It really does, it's really not that important, but when you're, when you're, when you're, when you've been losing and you just got knocked out. Yeah, man. It, it's funny how fast the fans forget about you. So it's like, I, I, I want to get back out there and let everybody, everybody know that I'm still here. You know, I still want to be the best. I still have the talent I, I i believe you know i believe i still have the talent to go out there and fight for the title again you know i'm ranked number six right now i don't know where i am now actually i gotta go back and look but i know i can i know i can fight for the title i know i can beat these guys I, i've already i've already beat masvidal and he's beating these guys you know what i mean so i know mm. i can do it <laughs> so I, it's more of like to, to prove to myself and to the fans that i'm yeah i'm still here like i don't forget about me Just, i am and to myself i'm like dude after my last fight I wanted to jump back out there in Greenville, like so bad. Um, I wanted to jump back out there and be like, guys, you know, that wasn't me. I, I, I better than that. But then you, that's why I have coaches there that say, hey, Stephen, you're not fighting in Greenville. Uh, I, don't think it would, I don't think it would be smart for me to do that. Just after taking a shot like that, nobody wants to go out in front of their hometown and get clipped and, you know, not fully healed up and just get knocked out in front of their hometown. So. I'm glad that I'm taking this time off to kind of let the body heal up, not just my head, but my body. You know, I, I, I've been training constantly for the longest time and now I'm still training, just not as hard. I'm doing more flexibility stuff, um, more healing stuff that I'm doing with the ice baths and heat. I'm doing a lot of sauna, a lot of massage therapy just to get that body right. Cause over the, over time you kind of neglect, neglect those things. And, um, Maybe that maybe your body doesn't react the way it should because of because it's not in, in the right shape or it's healed up like it's supposed to, you know. Mm. It, so, uh, yeah, man, I'm focused on that. It's fascinating to hear sort of, you know, this, this journey that you've been on and the changes you've been making sort of since since that loss, because you can feel that it's lit a fire under you. I also wonder, you know. 
what about the fact that we have a new champion in the division? Because for a long time, you know, Tyron Woodley, uh, you know, he, he was ruling that division. You obviously had two fights with him. You, they didn't go your way. And people thought, look, while, while Tyron's the champion, it's going to be tough for you to get that rematch. Now you've got Usman. You've got, you've got sort of fresh blood. Do you think that helps a lot as far as you uh, and I guess your path to the title? Oh, it definitely does. It definitely does. Because nobody wanted to see, wants to see a Wonder Boy, you know, Woodley <laughs> 3, you know? So when there's a new champ, it's like, yeah. You know, I was kind of at the, you know, for my career, I was definitely hoping for that. And I remember watching that fight, and it's like, in my head, not taking anything away from Usman, because Usman said he did exactly what he said he was going to do. But in my eyes, that wasn't the same Woodley that I fought. It didn't look like the same Woodley. And you can kind of tell it whenever he stepped in the octagon. You can tell it in his body, mm. where he looked. You can tell the way he looked in the octagon. It's like he wasn't the same. I don't know if he's more focused on his rap career. I know he was doing that for a while. I don't know if he's still doing it. But um, there it, it was something different about Tyron that night. So, mm. But that said, even now that there's a new champ, and I have no problems with Usman. I think Usman's a, I think he's a great champion. I think he's, he's, he's motivated. He's, he's, a, he's fresh in the division. Like he's hardworking. He's got, he's a family man. I think that's great. I think he's a great champ. I told him that the other day. I was like, man, I saw my international fight. I was like, you, you are a freak. You're an, you're a great champion. You know, mm. you, you hold the title very well. Mm. But I'm not, I'm not giving up on it, my friend. What, what, what did he say? What did he say when you told him that? No, no you know what? It, it, he. He smiled at me. I, he was pretty cool. He's like, yeah, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. And um, it's funny how a lot of people think, you know, because we are in the same division that, you know, we're not supposed to like each other. There's a lot of guys in our division. We, we see each other all the time. You know, it's, it's we're cool. I see Tyron. We're cool. I see we, we had a dance competition uh, two year, uh, year ago at International Fight Week. We had a dance hall. It was, you know, we're just chilling. Um, so, yeah, man, I, it, it was cool. It, it's I, I'm glad to see um, you know, uh, that guy, you know, be champion. I think he wears the title very well, you know? So it's, it's cool to see it, but, uh, you know, in my head, like I, I, I could be there, you know, I could be there. I've got, I've got the talent and, you know, my, and that's something my dad sees in me and he tells me that all the time. Like, listen, man, these guys, you could be, a, you could be champion right now. You know, you beat Masvidal and you see Masvidal beating these guys you can do that. You got better talent. You know, you, you're you're faster. You're long. You got better striking. You know, you wrestle. Everything's improving. You could be there. So I guess in in a way, he's telling me, you know, let's not give up on this. You know, I, I and and there's none of that in my head, but I mm. think it's kind of a reassurance that my dad is just being dad. You know, let you can do this. So he tells me that a lot. He sends it to me through text. You know, with a little, you know, smiley face or, you know. Dad being dad. <laughs> mm. I heard you one time talk about, you know, the importance of spending time with him because obviously he didn't spend much time with his dad. So it's it's nice to sort of see, you know, those kinds of things coming through. Just just sort of wondering, while we're talking about, like, you know, the division and stuff, obviously Ben Askren, I guess his stock in a, in a lot of ways went down. And for a long time, the question was, how well would he do in the UFC? And, you know, we're, we're starting to get some answers about that. What What was your biggest takeaway, I guess? about Ben sort of after this weekend and because he's a guy that you know people were sort of looking forward to maybe seeing you fighting uh, you fighting at some point yeah you know and and that could still be a possibility down the road but uh yeah I mean Ben Askren he, he he's a very strong he's a very strong wrestler and, he, and he's probably the best in the division I think you know the 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 places he's been with it you know the people he's trained with um but then again, you know, when you're in the fight game like this, some of the other things you have to improve on can't be just wrestling all the time, you know? Mm. So you got to continue to work on your strike and get better at that. Uh, his wrestling in jiu-jitsu is ridiculous. But every fight starts on your feet. You know, you saw the, the first fight. I thought I thought he got knocked out. Man, I thought he was over at first, but... That gum, Ben Askren, you know, he got knocked out this week, and he's, got, he's a tough boy. Golly, he's a tough boy. <laughs> and that's what wrestling does. We wrestle your whole life. You got to be a tough dude to wrestle. Like, I, I get most of my injuries wrestling. 
you know, mm-hmm. my neck, just stuff aches all the dang time. Like, dad, I don't see how you've been doing it since I was, you know, <laughs> three years old. But, you know, he had that, that first, the first fight in the UFC with Lawler. I thought Lawler was going to finish him, you know. He got tatted up. He got, in. you know, I thought he was knocked out. And then next thing you know, it got controversial submission. But then, you know, watching that, it's like, you know, you, you got to work on your striking, man. You know, you got to work on your movement or something. Your head movement. You can't just walk forward. And, um, you know, Mazidal just took better advantage of it. He knew exactly what he was going to do. Come forward and shoot. And he ran into a knee. So, I mean... I know I, I don't know what his training sessions are like, so I don't know if he does a lot of a lot of striking or anything. But you know, if if I had to work with him, I would definitely work a little bit more on his movement. Uh, you know, his fighting stances, his head, you know, some head movement, just get, just to work on because uh, movement's everything, man. Movement is everything when it comes to the fight game. You just stand there in the octagon. That's with anybody. You're gonna get caught. You gotta get. You gotta move in and out. You gotta work your angles to set stuff up but uh you know i think these guys know that they're professional so you know um i my hat goes off to to, to, to ben Askren for real because you know the, after that knockout the way he came after it was was pretty legit he had, you know definitely awesome mm. so uh we may be facing each other in the soon you never know uh i talked to sean shelby not too long ago and at the at that point i think it was in greenville there was really nobody ready you know i was looking you know asked about ponson ebo and I think he's got some kind of blood infection or something. He might be out for a while, mm. um, or blood disease. I don't know what was going on. And and RDA's got a fight, and Darren Till, I believe, still recovering. Um, so it was kind of like you know what. So I'm just kind of waiting on to see some of these other fights finish and, and maybe go from there when some of more of these guys open up. Mm. I'm curious about that. You mentioned Darren Till. I mean, uh, I was going to ask you sort of. What, what when the perfect return date would be for you but i mean darren till he just spoke to jim edwards recently he seems like he wants to get back into it would that be a rematch that you might consider as your next fight sort of a chance to fight him again i think a lot of people believed you won the first fight in liverpool would that be something that you might want to possibly run back as your next return fight or are you focusing on possibly fighting someone else with a more winning record right now you know, it, it, I wouldn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. Somebody with a winning record, it would be cool to face uh, Till again for sure in the States. Um, yeah, it's got to be in the States I, I, though, I, right? I, yeah, <laughs> man, in the States, man. Not in his backyard this time. But, um, yeah, man, I'll be up to fighting him. I mean, uh, you got uh, Leon Edwards and RDA. Would love to fight the winner of that. You got, uh, uh, who is it? Uh, Mike Perry. Who's that guy Mike Perry's fighting? He's got coming up Brazil guy. He's one. Of, he's I think he's undefeated right now. I'm not sure. I think he was in the Ultimate Fighter. He might have gotten beat by Usman, but uh, he's fighting. Uh, I think Mike Perry. So you know you got some guys out there that would be an epic fight. Uh, so Till is definitely one of them. I would love to run it back with him as well. I'm curious as well. Obviously, uh, Robbie Lawler's versing Colby Covington. Uh, if Lawler does beat Covington and doesn't get the next title shot, I mean a lot of people sort of always have spoken about that uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, Robbie Lawler fight. Is that something you think you might be able to finally get? I hope so. That would be such an epic fight, fight I think. Man, I would love to face, and I've been, you know, wanting to fight him for a while, ever since he was champion. And and I thought that was going to happen, but it never did. Mm. And it kind of just stuck with me. Like, man, I would love to fight him. Because, lo- like Anthony Pettis, I've been a fan of Robbie Lawler since the Strike Force days. I mean, when he was fighting at 185, just knocking fools out. Bro. Yeah. It, it, you know, he's just a, just a, a dang, like, like a Viking. Like, he's just out for blood, that guy. And I saw a different look in him, his last fight with Astrid. Yeah. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, 100%. His he's buddy as well. Oh, 100%. Like, his, his, uh, his, um, his last fight with RDA and even... Even when it was with uh, Carlos Condit, it was he was just kind of like blah. He was uh, he was he was Robbie, but this last one he just had a fire in him, and you can see it in his eyes before the fight even started. Yeah. His body even looked different, like you said. So, oh uh, yeah, I would love to make that fight happen. That would be cool. Mm. Just curious, we'll, we'll let you go in a moment, Stephen. Uh, we we know you're going to take that ring apart and, and move to the gym. Uh, so we really appreciate your time. 
just obviously your last opponent, he's taking on Nate Diaz. Anthony Pettis is taking on Nate Diaz uh, very shortly. Just wondering, you know, wh what you think about that fight and how they sort of match up stylistically. It's a fight a lot of people are, are curious about and looking forward to. Yeah, man, I think that's a very interesting fight. Um, you got a, 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 an explosive guy versus kind of like a, a marathon guy. You know, Nick Diaz being the marathon. I mean, uh, yeah, Nate Diaz being the marathon marathoner and you know, uh, Anthony Pettis being the more explosive guy, the sprinter. Um, Anthony, he he's had some gas tank problems in the past. I think he might have fixed that. Um, and but he's super fast and he's tricky. You know what I'm saying? It's like he's caught some really good jujitsu guys. He's very good everywhere. So is Nate. Nate takes a lot of damage, as you see, but he's very hard because he's very long. Like he keeps his opponents uh, at bay with the strike, as you saw against Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor had a hard time, um, you know, catching him with his hands because he was so long. And he's just relentless. You know, Nate is relentless. Him and his brother take shots, and they just keep coming forward, keep coming forward. But Anthony Pettis is fast, and I think he's – I'm going for Anthony just because, you know, I'm a, I've been a fan for him for a while, and he was my last loss. So I'd like to see him do well, you know. So I'd like to see my buddy Anthony do do work, do some work. And then we were cool uh, after the fight, too. He's such a cool dude, man. And, and we come from a similar, similar background, so I'd like to see that style do well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but that's going to be – it's going to be fun. I mean, hopefully Anthony Pettis has a, a you know, a better – a good a gas tank. And um, I think he can out-trick Nick Diaz. Uh, I keep saying Nick. Nate Diaz. <laughs> uh, but he's just got to he's just got to watch out. Like he, he'll sit there and punch Nate to death, and Nate will just keep on coming. He's like a zombie. He just keeps coming forward, just punching, punching. He beats guys with just overwhelming strikes constantly, pop, 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 and he just breaks. He just breaks dudes. So, um, but it's been a while since he's fought. I mean, I don't even know how long he's been out. Several years, right? I think it's been a few years. Mm. I think his last fight might have been Connor. Yeah, right? UFC two hundred two. That was two thousand sixteen. Yeah. I want to say. So it's been a while. So is 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 Nate the same guy? We don't know. So I'm going. I'm going with my man uh, Pettis. Mm. Uh, Stephen, we'll let you go in just a second. Just a couple more things we want to mention. First off, is of course your Twitch channel. People may not know, but you've got a Twitch channel where people can watch you play games like Call of Duty, and people know you as the nice guy around. But you hear that we hear there's actually a little bit of a you're a little bit of a rager sometimes when things Bro. don't go your way. Is there any it truth to this? It is 100% true. Like, I don't know what it is. That damn game, it free, it gets me fired up. Like, I will sit there in rage. Um, well, number one, I'm not that good. You know, I, I love the game, and it's a great way to actually talk with fans. Um, I always get on. We always talk about the fight. Um, and I get on with my brother, Evan, who is a 185er. He fights. He's, he's, an, he's an analyst. He loves, uh, he loves to break down fighters as well. Uh, my buddy Trent. Uh, I get on with Chris Weidman a lot, John Belante. So we get on, we have a good time. Um, and other fighters, too. My buddy Cody, who I train with. So, um, yeah, man, it's Wonderboy. Uh, it's actually twitch.tv slash Faith. So check it out if you can. Come and join me. We call it the Fight Club. We hang out. We talk about fights. Y'all watch me game and rage. <laughs> What? It's funny, man. It's funny. We have a good time. Just quickly, what happens when you rage? Have you have you ever broken any controls? I've broken a bunch of controls myself. I'm not mm -hmm. proud to say it. Do you, do you ever go that far? What is, what happens when you rage? No, I, I've never gone that far. I just cuss up a storm. Wow. And I'm, I, I, but but I'm not the only one. My brother Evan is way worse. He actually made it on a rage compilation on YouTube. <laughs> Dude, he loses and he throws his controller. He's already went through like four or five controllers. And so he, he put a futon uh, right next to him. So when he throws it, it bounces back. And he just lands in his hand. But the last one, he missed it and poked the hole in the sheet, like knocked the hole in the sheetrock. Huh. And he's sitting there looking at this thing. He's like, oh, shit, I'm going to die. Like, my wife's going to kill me. My wife's going to kill me. And it was funny, man. It was so freaking funny. And he'll rage. And next thing you know, you hear, you'll hear his phone like go bling. And this is why it's saying, shut up. Like, you know, he's got a big girl. And she'll come down here and come down and yell at him. It's funny, man. He's more of a rage than I am. He's the one who breaks controllers. I just cuss up a storm. Like, it, it, for some reason, gaming gets me to that point. But it's fun, you know? 
uh, it's another way too. I've been I've been gaming for a while. I'm, I'm just not very good at it, but it's fun. You know, we got we got a you know a handful of dubs, but uh, you know I'm more of a Call of Duty Blackout. I do Apex, PUBG. I've never been a real uh, Fortnite guy, but I will play it from time to time. But mm. it's fun, man. You got you guys game? Y'all game? Oh yeah, well, Casper's like a professional game. I, I haven't seen the guy lose a game in any in any. In, he studies the manual, but uh, but I play Fortnite and I get destroyed. I get destroyed by five year olds all the time. I was gonna say, Stephen, not only the Twitch channel but your YouTube channel. You've actually got a massive fan in myself and my family. We love the new oh. YouTube channel, dude. You, I feel like it's one of the biggest hidden secrets in MMA right now. I say that because. We watched The Day in the Life of Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, a video I recommend everybody watches after they get off this interview because your life is crazy, man. I don't know how you do everything that you do. Plus, fitting in an interview with us, the guy's driving a school bus around, picking up kids, <laughs> dropping kids off, doing a million classes. Then you do these crazy technique videos where you break down how people can stretch. You break down some footwork. Then you put up a crazy video of you and Chris Weidman training, and you mention how your neck is sore after wrestling. Dude, uh, that was that was an epic video all in itself. I love how you were trying to do the switch on Chris Weidman, but it just would not work <laughs> for you. We're it didn't work. It did not work. You're, you're we're doing it now. Then you go to Bahamas. You go to the Bahamas. You guys are on holiday. Yeah. But you're still going down to the beach, working out, and producing content. Absolutely unbelievable. What, what What's Thank coming you, up man. on the channel? I actually, I honestly say this honestly. It's one of the best and funnest channels out there right now. Oh, Apart man, from well, I appreciate video, it, bro. man. Check it out if you guys can. Uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, it's, uh, you know, hit that subscribe button. But yeah. uh, we got something coming at you weekly. You know, we got our next uh, um, actually video coming out this thir this coming Thursday where we were at uh, International Fight Week. We were at the UFC uh, Performance Institute. So we did a big tour of the, of the place because a lot of people don't know what it's like to be there. I've never seen the inside of it. That mm. place is massive, 30,000 square foot facility. And it's got everything, everything you can imagine. Sleeping pods, like a sleeping pod. Like I didn't even wow. know this existed. You got hot tubs. You got you got cryotherapy. You have like um, literally, it's like a science lab. You're inside an altitude chamber. I've got an altitude ch a tent, but this is like a full room altitude chamber. And they got they hook up masks and stuff. Check your O2 levels, your oxygen levels. Like it's it's out of this world. So we did a technique Tuesday there, which comes out the following Tuesday. This Thursday, we did uh, a training session there and kind of a, uh, a tutorial and uh, like an overview of um, a tour of the, the facility. So it's awesome, man. It's great. Yeah, no, so check absolutely. it out, man. Check it out. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, and we'll be having some more UFC fighters and stuff coming in. So we'll get, we, we, we got, we got you coming at you, coming at you weekly. So tune in, man. I'm so glad you guys follow it. Nah, dude, it's absolutely amazing. And I love the close-up uh, <laughs> camera angles when you put it right up to your dad's eye or right up to your face <laughs> and you're, you're doing your crazy faces and stuff. It's, I feel like I feel like uh, people definitely need to check it out. A true story is I was, I was meaning to go to the gym and do a workout and I watched one of the videos on YouTube channel just to get, give me some energy. I'm like, all right, this guy, if this guy can train five times in a day and, and drive a school bus full of children around and do karate classes... <laughs> I should get up off my ass and get into the gym. So I think it's about, and also you do some crazy neck training. The neck training yes. that you do with the weights, I'm like, all right, this is, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to attempt this, but I'll never be able to turn my head again. So guys, make sure <laughs> to check that out. And of course, twitch.tv forward slash Wonderboy Faith, Twitter and Instagram at Wonderboy MMA. And of course, the YouTube channel, The Best Kept Secret in MMA. Steven, we could talk to you all day, man, but we've been very greedy with our time. And oh, after nine okay. guys into a day of Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, I kind of feel like uh, we don't want to push it too much because I feel like you've probably been up for about twenty four hours driving kids <laughs> around and picking up gyms and Dude, training. So we're gonna do we're gonna do another one because uh, that was just my school year, like during the school year. My summer time's <laughs> even crazier. I'm up at wow. seven o'clock, you know, partying with kids. On we have summer <laughs> camps, you know, all day long, and we're going everywhere, and then trying to fill in my figure out when I'm training in between that. So it's, that's crazy. Dude, and and in, between really your, in between your kids' classes, you're like yelling and screaming and you're like, all right, guys. I'm like, how does this guy have the energy? One day we're going <laughs> to, one day, we're, one day, Stephen Thompson, we're going to have to uh, dissect you, figure out what's inside you because it's not human, man. If, 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 this, if men in black 
was a real thing. You'd be one of the first per- people that people would think, oh, this guy's definitely an alien. <laughs> this guy's an alien. <laughs> yes. So thanks so much for joining us on the program. And of course, subscribe to Stephen's uh, YouTube channel. We can't wait to see what's next. And, we're, and oh, as we wrap, Stephen, just quickly, uh, perfect date, scenario, and opponent. What would it be? Okay, so I'm looking at Madison Square Garden. Love fighting in New York City. So looking at MSG, I don't know if that's October or November yet. I don't think it's pinned down. Um, but I'm looking to fight there again and give me anybody, anybody. I don't care. I just want to fight. I want to, I want to show the world what I'm capable of and I'm, and I'm not giving up on that title. So I, I don't care. You guys pick. <laughs> awesome. Well, we can't wait to see what happens, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, it's always a pleasure having you on the program. Hey man, anytime guys, anytime. Hey, this is Ariel Hawani, and you're listening to Submission Radio with my two favorite mates, Dennis and Casper. All right, guys. Our next guest is one of the top-ranked light heavyweights in the UFC, a former UFC title challenger coming off an impressive win over Alexander Gustafsson at UFC Sweden. He is Anthony Lionheart-Smith. Welcome back to Submission Radio, man. How are you this week? I'm good, man. I'm glad to be talking to you guys. I'm glad we were able to reschedule and, uh, and uh, hang out for a little bit. Oh, for sure, man. We've been very, very lucky because the family's gone off to have some food. But mm-hmm. Anthony Smith, kind enough to delay his meal to speak to Submission Radio. We feel very, very lucky. And it looked like you had an awesome time in Vegas for International Fight Week. Tell us, Anthony, what were some of the highlights of the week for you? Because we saw you were sort of all over the place having fun across the, across the board. Yeah, you know, to be honest with you, Uh, I've been to Vegas about 20 times, probably, Mm. and I've never been able to go and actually experience Vegas. I was either fighting or getting ready for a fight or I was training for a fight and I was there doing some, you know, some physical therapy stuff or I was there for a press conference or something like that. I've never been able to just go there out of camp, you know, and and, and do whatever I wanted to do. And we had a blast, man. You know, I I did a couple uh, appearances and signings got to really hang out with the fans at international fight week for the first time. So that was a different experience. You know, it's, you don't really, you don't really grasp how, how dedicated and, 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 you know, how these people are to your journey until, until you're right there in front of them. And so that was the first opportunity I was ever able to really do that. And it was really overwhelming to be honest with you. I didn't really realize how many people really supported me and, 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 and how I affect their lives. You know, you hear people all the time here, you know, they have fans say cool stuff to them. And, and, but to have fans tell me that, you know, I motivated them to, to start losing weight or, or, or women say that, you know, my journey from the bottom helped them get over whatever they were going through. And guys that, you know, there was a guy that his, him and his best friend were, were, were really good, really big fans of mine. And, and his friend committed suicide. So I was able to talk to him about the foundation he created because of that i mean it was just it was it was overwhelming like how much you really affect people and and i think that you know it, it kind of changes your perspective on what we're really doing here a little bit so outside of that i was able to go out i had some drinks i went to a couple of clubs i had a cabana by the pool uh you know the typical vegas thing but but you know the the big part that really stood out was was the the, the face-to-face interaction with the with thousands of fans you know that actually give a shit about what i'm doing Mm-hmm, for sure. You mentioned the cabana by the pool. We're not used to seeing our Anthony Smith with the tan, so we'll see what that looks like <laughs> when you fight next. But just quickly, you right. mentioned it, and I was kind of, I had a bit of a theory on this, Anthony. I mean, you've had a, a huge year since the last time you did International Fight Week. I mean, you beat Shogun, you beat Vulcan, you had a gutsy performance against John Jones, and you ran, rounded it off with a great win over a super tough Gustafsson in Sydney, in Sweden, sorry. In a lot of ways, was last weekend an opportunity for you to sort of look back on a great year in your career and sort of enjoy it a little bit with some of the fans there? It's almost, you. I mean, last International Fight Week, it was, you know, you, you were doing some great things. You beat Rashad Evans and stuff. But over, over the year period since then, you, I mean, you really achieved some huge things in a short amount of time. Was it a chance for you to look back on those things and sort of celebrate them with the fans? Yeah, yeah, it was. That's that's a really good way of putting it. You know, I, being able to be at International Fight Week uh, after I, you know, after the year that I had, and and beat some of the guys that I beat. You know, I I, I kind of injected myself into that elite level fighter that 
that I, you know, in that category, you know, that there's, there's that with the fans, there's absolutely categories and groups that they ball you into. And I think I was in that, like, he's pretty damn tough. Uh, and I like to watch him fight, but you know, he hasn't really done much yet group. And now I'm, I'm in that group where I fought John Jones. I beat Alexander Gustafson. I, I was in the, the fight of the night performance with Tiago Santos. Uh, and, and so I think that the, re- the reception that I got from the fans is absolutely uh, a reward for the, the body of work that I've put in since uh, I moved to 205. You know, like, I think people forget my first, I mean, I, it, it, I think a lot of people feel like I've been at 205 for a long time. <laughs> yeah. my, first two, my first 205 fight with Ju- was June 8th of last year. It's just over a year and a year now. It's, a, you know, it's 13 months I've been at 205. So, uh, you know, I was just, honestly, man, I just, I just had so much damn fun and, you know, I, I did some things that I've never done. You know, I've never gone and been super crazy in Vegas. And, I, and, and and I've never, you know, when we walked into the Fan Fest the first time and they're, you know, they were saying, hey, Anthony and Cowboy, you guys got a really, you guys got some really big lines. Like that alone, just them saying that was overwhelming mm-hmm. to me. And then when I got there and seen it, I was like, holy shit. Like these people actually care. You know, I, I never did this to be famous or, or be the most popular fighter. It's just what I wanted to do and who I am. But you know, I just, again, I, I just reiterate, I guess I, I was just blown away at, at how many people give a shit. Well, it's crazy. Like, I remember John Morgan telling us a story when you approached him in an airport before you were in the UFC. <laughs> and, and I think we touched yeah. on this last time we had a show and you said, you know, like one day you'll be covering me, I'll, I'll be in the UFC. Mm-hmm. And to see where you've come, you know, obviously your time at middleweight, now your time at light heavyweight fighting for the title here you are at, at uh you know the the fitness expo it's just crazy because a lot of people might say that you know i'll do this or i'll do that but you've actually done that and to actually have you know some of the biggest lines it's uh it, it must be a crazy moment of reflection it, it is and, it, and but part of it was expected you know i that the fan part of it and the in the reception from the crowds and and you know when i walked in the arena even to get my seat you know that half the arena went crazy uh like I, I never expected that because I never thought about that. That was never something that I was striving for. You know, it, it's one of those things like you, I, I didn't even know that that was a thing, you know? So, but the, when I told John Morgan that in, in that airport, having that beer in, in New Jersey or wherever we were, uh, I absolutely meant that. And, and that wasn't me just blowing smoke and, and trying to like, you know, do your old buddy believe, achieve, conceive bullshit. And just, if you say it enough, it'll come true. Like I, I really believed that, you know, and, and I knew that I would someday, somehow I was going to make it here. So I, me being here isn't necessarily a surprise. It's more the reaction to the other people that's surprising to me. Well, you, you mentioned believe, uh, conceive, achieve. And uh, obviously everybody knows who, who that was directed at. So you were there at, at UFC 239. Uh, yeah. You watched, you watched your, your good friend, Close, close pal, Luke Rockhold. Mm-hmm. What, what, what did you think of that? I, I imagine it would have been somewhat satisfying for you, given the, the the war of words that have sort of gone back and forth between you guys. Yeah, you know. First off, before I say anything about Luke Rockhold, I don't, I don't ever wish for for anyone to get injured. You know what I mean? It's one thing to go out there and and get beat or get knocked out or whatever, but like. I wouldn't have tweeted anything or said anything had I known that his jaw was broken. I, I, I had no, I mean, there's no way for me to know that I tweeted it. I mean, he wasn't awake before I was tweeting. So I, I know that it, it, I come off as an asshole, but you know, I, I don't wish anyone gets injured. That's what it comes down to. I, I would have never prayed that Luke Rockwell got injured. I wasn't even hoping that he lost, you know, I don't, I, I would never wish for failure for somebody else. Uh, I wanted him to be humbled. And I think, I think that, that, that happened, you know, and everything that I said was true and everything that he said, wasn't, I, you know, I'm, you know, he said I was a bum and that Rockhold or that Gustafson was going to walk through me. And he said that I, you know, I don't deserve to be in this division. And he just moved up because bums like me can get title shots. It ain't that fucking easy. You know, like, I don't, I don't understand why like people look at me and think, well, if he can do it, I can do it. It's not like that. It's not that easy. Like, Rockhold wouldn't make it five seconds fighting the way that I fight. He, he doesn't have the ability to do what I do. He doesn't have the defensive skills. He doesn't have the footwork, and he doesn't have the heart. I mean, once he couldn't take Wilhovich down, he looked like a coward. Like, he, he was broken, and he was gassed after two and a half minutes. Like, 
it's it's not that easy. And and I know that all these 85ers come up and are, are looking at me and they're looking at Tiago Santos and they're saying, well, if they can do it, I can do it. No, you fucking can't. Like, it's we just had a, a perfect example of it, of a former champion, a guy who ran through several people at 185, move up and get starched by a bum, that, by his words, that Blahovich was a bum. He said that several times. He's a nobody. So, like, I just don't, I don't understand how, how he continues to keep being so goddamn cocky because every time he's like this, it doesn't work out and he gets embarrassed. And, and I, so I just don't, under, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, had he won, I would have loved to ha- have, have gotten that fight and been the one to do that. But at this point, Luke Rockhold, it'll take Luke Rockhold two and a half years to get to me. You know, I mean, he's going to have to start at the bottom and work his way up. And I know that that's probably not something he's willing to do because his, his ego won't allow it. His ego won't allow him to break down the things that he's doing wrong. You know, I don't, I, I keep saying his chin is shot and it may, maybe it's not his chin. I don't know. Maybe it's just his inability to, to have any defensive goddamn skills. But uh, I just, I hope that he heals up okay. Obviously, I don't, you know, I hope that that's all right. But, you know, maybe this time the Luke Rockhold steps away. Yes, Anthony, I mean, you just mentioned it. It would take Luke sort of two and a half years to get back up and, and get a fight with you. Is a part of you kind of disappointed, though, that this fight doesn't go down? It kind of seems like... It was a really, really hot one that a lot of fans wanted to see. Are you disappointed that you sort of didn't get a chance to sort of show what Luke... What, what you, you mentioned that you'd punch him in the face, basically, at one of the press conferences. Are you disappointed that you didn't get a chance to do that first before Jan when he sort of went into the division? Um, so it's a two-part answer there. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, Luke Rockhold still remains someone that I would love to slap the shit out of. He's just, <laughs> just not a good dude. There's, you know, uh, we know some mutual people and, and I've heard nothing but awful things about him. And, I, and I've heard nothing but awful things about me come out of his mouth. So that's not how I was raised. That's not how we do it here in the Midwest in small town, Nebraska. You talk shit, you get hit. And that's just how it goes. But I'm also an adult. You know what I mean? So I, I understand that that's not exactly the way things go all the time. But uh, I would have loved to have been the one to to do that to him. Uh, on the flip side, it's kind of a serves your right bitch moment, you know. Like talking, you talk all that shit. You couldn't, you couldn't beg your way into a fight with me right now, you know. Like coming off a win, even then the UFC didn't like it, you know. Like I, we already, I was already waiting for that fight, and as soon as Rockwell got the win, we were gonna go into go into those negotiations and figure out where and when, but. And the UFC didn't even like it. They didn't like the fact that I was going to take a fight with a guy who wasn't ranked and, and may or may not be coming off a win over, over Blahovich in his first fight. Like, UFC didn't even like that shit. So my family didn't like it. My manager didn't like it. Uh, I just wanted it. I just is something. Sometimes you just got to do something you really want to do, not that you have to do. So, uh, And sometimes it doesn't always have to make sense. So, you know, I. it would have been nice to fight him, but at the same time, you know, I, I know he's sitting at home feeling really goddamn stupid. Uh, at least, in in as, as far as when it comes to him and I, I know he feels really stupid and he regrets saying all that shit. Wow. Um, I also wanted to. Obviously, we got to touch on what's next for you now that you know that that you were so close to wanting that fight or, or you know having that fight come to fruition. But obviously, you know, two thirty nine. Got to get your thoughts on John Jones versus Tiago Santos and what you thought of his performance. A lot of people are kind of divided. You know, on one hand, Tiago, obviously very tough to sort of go in there with, uh, you know, such an injured leg. A lot of people also felt that John Jones kind of looked a little bit more human than, than usual. What was your take on the fight? You know, as far as as far as who won, honestly, it, I wouldn't have been super surprised either way. It, it was just a super close fight. Uh, I think by, by people saying that John Jones looks human, it's taken credit away from Tiago. But... Oh. As far as the aesthetics and looking from it from the outside, that's how it looks. Uh, but I've been saying for for a long time, when it comes to mindset and toughness, there's there's me and Tiago Santos, and then there's everybody else. Uh, that dude's a savage. He's a, he's just a fucking savage, and that's why I like him. That's why I like him so much. Me me and him we had our we had we had our fight coming up. There was no trash talk. There was no shit talking. There was nothing. Like we both looked at each other and smiled because we knew exactly what we were gonna do. 
he couldn't have a fight like that with John Jones for the exact same reason I couldn't have a fight like that with, with John Jones. He would take advantage of, of your explosions. He would take advantage of those spots instead of doing what the fans really want to see, and that's throw, throw down and be exciting and do whatever it is that feels natural. John would take advantage of that, and that's fine. You know, that's, that's how John fights. He's, he's here to win. Uh, and that's, he's a competitor, you know, like my coach, Mark breaks fighters down into, into three categories. There's martial artists, there's, there's competitors and there's fighters. Uh, John Jones is absolutely a competitor. Uh, and guys like Tiago and myself are, we're fighters, you know, and, and we fight first and we'll compete second. That's just how it is. Uh, but I thought Tiago looked great. I thought he did a great job. He did a good job of attacking the legs, uh, until he got injured. So early in the fight, he did a really good job of doing that. He picked his spots really well. You know, typically he crashes in and blitzes, and he didn't do a whole lot of that. He did a lot of exploding on John's forward mo motion, which John doesn't do a lot of, so there wasn't a whole shit ton of explosions because John doesn't typically commit first. So uh, I, th I thought he fought a hell of a fight. Uh, I, you know, I've been, I talked with his manager a little bit. Him and his man, him, or me and his manager are, are, are friends and, and talk pretty often. So, uh, you know, I, would tell Tiago the same thing I told his manager. That's, that's a performance you can be proud of, especially given how injured he was. Uh, and, you know, sometime down the road, Tiago will work his way back, and I'm sure at some point in time, him and I will see each other again as well. Mm -hmm. And I have to congratulate you on uh, having a great time in terms of previewing things during fight week, Anthony. I almost feel like you were a veteran analyst. You did so many previews for the fight, and you had... So many good points. In an interview with our buddy Oscar Willis of the Mac Life, he said it's going to be hard for anybody to beat Jones on their first try. So I'm just wondering, sort of, after fighting John recently, can you share in your mind some of the stuff that you learned, or maybe some of the stuff that you might do differently when if, if you got a chance to fight him again? I imagine just listening from your breakdowns of, of, of this fight with Tiago, you sort of knew a lot of things about John Jones and a lot of his in, in and outs going into that fight with Tiago. Yeah, I do, man. I, I've become absolutely obsessed with John Jones. Uh, it's almost embarrassing how <laughs> I, I have focused on, studied. It, it's it's become an obsession. Uh, you know, I was sitting next to Rashad Evans during the during the fight, and I can I, I'm like learning John's mannerisms. I can almost <laughs> tell you what he's thinking sometimes. It's weird, or at least what I think he's thinking. Maybe I'm fucking mm. wrong. Who knows? But. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm sitting next to Rashad, and and I, I would start watching John, and, and I would say he's gonna spin. And Rashad was like, "What?" And I was like, "He's gonna spin," and like right on cue, he spun. You know, and then, you know, he I, he'd, he'd go. You know, he, I could see just the way he was moving, and I'd I'd be like front kick to the body, and there it was. It's like here comes the oblique kick, boom, there it is. Tiago circles front kick to the body, like he's looking for a head kick, throws a head. Kick. Like I can fucking tell you exactly what he's gonna do. Like the problem is. And here's here's the problem. What are you gonna do about it? That's that that's the new problem, right? So, I thought Tiago would have a better job of getting to John than I did. Uh, on in the moments that I did decide that I was gonna go for whatever reason, I couldn't pull the trigger. But the moments I did want to go, I thought Tiago would do a better job of the, of I did than I did in those few moments. Uh, and he didn't. So. You know, it, it really comes down to, I mean, I think we've already found that I'm defensively sound enough to be to be able to protect myself, which is something that not a lot of people can say. And unfortunately, Daniel Cormier is one of those people. He can't be on the outside with John Jones and stay conscious. He just can't. Uh, so I got that. I, I can defend the takedowns. Uh, I think we've already found that John doesn't want to engage me in the jiu-jitsu game because any opportunity I had to go to a actual position, John backed out. Uh, he did, you know, he tried to take my back and as long as I had, you know, I had wrist control and he wouldn't, he wouldn't engage in actual jujitsu, which is, which is smart. You know, like I think everyone who's deep in the game knows that I'm super dangerous. If you start playing that game, uh, honestly, the problem is getting to John Jones. That's the problem. Uh, and that's, that's honestly where my focus is really mentally and, and why I've been. You know, you're reaching out and talking to different people and looking for different ideas. And, and it doesn't matter how defensively sound I am. It doesn't matter how many takedowns I defend. It doesn't matter how much he doesn't want to grant and, like, engage in jiu-jitsu. If I can't get to him, I can't beat him. So 
you know, that's that's kind of where my mindset is. And I don't give a shit if he sees it. Like, I'm, I, I've said it over and over and over and over again. I'm coming, and there's no one that's going to stop me. It's fascinating because, obviously, you know, the Jackson Winkle John team is known for, you know, kind of a lot of secrecy in terms of game plans and things like this and, and here's you just being so candid about how look this is this is what i'm looking for this these are the problems this is exactly how i'm trying to break it down this is where i'm up to mm-hmm. in that challenge and so to when you say you know getting to john jones um what, what do you what do you see that trajectory like how many you obviously beat alexander gustafson had an impressive showing what do you think that trajectory oh, looks I, like when I, when I, when I say get to John Jones, I don't mean getting back to the fight. No, you mean you I mean getting no past his reach, right? Yeah, I got to. Yeah. Well, it's not even his reach. That's the thing. It's not his hands that are the problem. Mm. You don't see John Jones starching anybody with punches. Uh, and I felt him firsthand. It's not a. It's not a problem. It's his distance management. He's just better at it than I was. Mm. Uh, and I'm okay with saying that out loud. Fuck it. Like I'll get better. Uh, I'll figure that out. If that's the biggest problem I have, then I'm 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 okay. Uh, and it's and it's his bottom half, and it's no secret that I traditionally have had a hard time uh, with kickers, and it, and and we're working on it. You know, I only got one hand right now, anyway, so that's what we're working on. It's it's figuring out the, the dealing with big kickers, dealing with with leg and body kickers. I, you know, I, I I mean, I ate Tiago Santos's biggest spinning heel kick to the jaw. Uh, and that's the only time I've ever been kicked clean in the head. So, uh, and I, and I blocked nine out of 10 of John's. Uh, and one of them was, was, was just barely his toes, you know? So, uh, yeah, I don't know what that looks like as far as, you know, technically like getting to him. Uh, I guess we just, we're fixing one thing at a time. Uh, and he'll probably fight before I can get to him. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not healthy. I'm not going to be able to fight this year, mm-hmm. likely. So he's going to fight one more time before anyways. And, I mean, who's he going to fight? Reyes? Good luck with that. Mm. Um, so as far as getting back to John, like who I'm going to fight, I, I, I think that there's me, Jan, Corey Anderson, and Dominic Reyes. One of them is going to fight John. So I would take myself out of that. It probably won't be me. Uh, so when it comes down to Jan, Corey, or Reyes, one of them's going to fight John, one of them's going to fight me when I come back, and the other one's going to sit and either fight someone lower down or, or wait. So but it'll be one, I'll fight one of those three guys, likely Corey Anderson. He, he wouldn't mind knocking him out either. <laughs> why, 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 yeah. why, 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 why Corey? Why, why is he the guy that you'd like to knock out as well? Man, he, he's just mad. He's just, he's just always talking shit. You know, he's, he's like trying to trying to take a book out of or take a page out of Luke Rockhold's book. Like, I've never done anything to Corey except clean up his fucking mess. Uh, they offered me a fight with Corey Anderson in Lincoln, Nebraska. He turned it down because he wasn't ready. And then not long after that, I took a fight with Shogun, who they offered to him first. And he turned it down. So then I took it because he wouldn't. And then Glover to share needed an opponent like a week later, and he takes that fight. So he turns down me, turns down Shogun, and then takes Glover because that's a fight that in his head he feels he can win. He won't take a fight with anybody that he's not 100% sure he can beat. So he goes in against a guy who's, t- who's known to be taken down and held there and wins a fight and then wants to talk shit like he's the best in the world. All right, fine. Whatever. Not a big deal. I, then I didn't hear anything from Corey, you know? So because we're in the goddamn locker room and he's feeling real goddamn stupid because he knows that I know all that stuff. So he won't even look at me. <laughs> so then, so then they offer him the Gus fight after I fight John Jones, and he won't take it. So then I take it, and then he tries to go back and say, "No, no, 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 no! I'll take it now. I'll take it now." I was like, "It's too late. I already signed it, you idiot." <laughs> so like, here I am cleaning up your goddamn mess again. Like, fine. So now, from now on, I hope they offer Corey Anderson the title shot because it means I'll probably end up with it. <laughs> that that's hilarious it's again it's another dude that i've never done nothing to like he's just mad because you've been in the division for how many years and haven't even sniffed a title shot and then guys like me and tiago come in and and have three fights and get one like there's a reason it's not because we sell any more tickets than you like it's not because we're 
you know, quote unquote, better than you. We, we just go out there and we put it on the line and we fight and we take fights when they're offered. Like, I'm not saying be a company guy and suck Dana's dick or anything. I'm, but be a goddamn fighter, you know? And, and if you have a style that's kind of, you know, dependent on winning decisions, then just count on having to win a whole lot more of them. Cause that's just how the game goes. No one wants to watch you fucking dry hump someone's leg for 15 minutes. It's, it, unless they're a, a big jujitsu fan uh, or a, or a high level wrestler, no one wants to see it. And I'm, and I'm a jujitsu guy at heart. So I, I, I just don't know what, I don't know what it is about me that, that rubs some of these guys the wrong way, but like, I'm not a guy. I mean, I think we can all agree. I'm not the guy that goes out and picks fights. Like I don't, I don't go out talking trash about people because I don't give a shit. I, I'm doing my own shit. I'm, I'm in my own little hole here in here in Nebraska, and I do my own thing. I, I don't even keep a pulse on any of that stuff. So I, I just don't know. I, and I know that he looks at me like I'm an easy fight, and and so did everyone else. So did so did Gustafson. So did John Jones. So did Rashad. So did Shogun. So did Ozdemir. Like I just don't know why he thinks he's any different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fascinating stuff, Anthony. And we really appreciate your time. We'll let you go in just a second so you can enjoy your meal with your family. Oh, we're going to end this thing on Corey Anderson? No, 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 no we've got no, a couple no, no, more yeah. things before we, we, we <laughs> let you go. Just quickly, uh, people sort of theorizing that while you're on break, John might take this fight with Daniel Cormier in December and possibly do it at heavyweight. I'm just wondering, you know, you know John Jones so well. You, know, you, you mentioned how you can tell what he's going to throw when you watch his fights. Do you think if he fights DC at heavyweight, um, the outcome would be any different? Do you believe that Daniel Cormier could beat him if that fight does happen in December at heavyweight? I think at heavyweight, Daniel has a better chance. Uh, but I don't think, I don't see anything that Daniel Cormier does that is going to beat John. And some of that is just body type and some of that is style. So, Daniel can't do what someone like me or Tiago can do. He can't stay on the outside and be safe, right? So we've seen that in the second fight, that as soon as he pulled off the pressure and backed off a little bit, John started picking him apart and started playing that game with the head kicks. And, and Daniel's not tall enough or long enough to, to be a threat to John Jones from that far away, and John Jones can still hurt him. So in, 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 the, in the pace that Daniel has to set to get on the inside, uh, with John Jones and getting that clinch position and throw those bombs, it, it's it's such a high pace. You can't keep that pace for 25 minutes. It's it's too hard to do. Uh, and I I think that Daniel, if if he if there's no threat of him taking you down, he's gonna he's gonna have a hard time beating you. And he's already showed in two fights now he can't take down John Jones. Daniel Cormier can take down any other man in the world, but mm -hmm. for whatever reason, he can't take down John Jones. So now we have three things that are, are, are working against him in the John Jones fight. He can't take John down. John's dangerous in the clinch with the elbows. And Daniel has a hell of a time keeping that pace. And he can't stay safe on the outside. So short of a big lucky shot, I don't see where Daniel beats John. I don't care what weight class it's in. And John ain't small. I mean, I, I know that people keep saying how easy he makes 205. He's not a small man. Mm. I mean, he, I bet he walks, I mean, he's got a 240. I mean, mm. not a small guy. So if Daniel's at 265 even, he's still five foot eight or nine or whatever <laughs> it is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. John's, they say John's six four. I'm every bit of six four. And John had me by an inch. So John's six five, 240. I don't see there really being that big of a difference than there is at 205. And if they do it at 205, I think it gets worse than it was the second time because mm -hmm. Daniel's going to have to kill himself to get to 205, and he's not going to be able to be uh, a high-performing professional athlete at 205 pounds. Mm -hmm. All right, Ann. All right. Well, I mean, look, it's a great, I reckon it's not just you. That's a great preview. Now, as we wrap up, and we, by the way, we're excited to have you on this program. It's been so long, and you have to come back and talk to us some more sure. when your next fight gets locked in let's finish it on this though give us your ideal time frame an ideal fight if everything goes to plan if your hand heals up if everything works out perfectly when would you like to fight and who would it be against let's finish out on that um well 
I mean, obviously the division could rock, could move around a little bit. Mm. You know, it could change. Guys could fight. Guys could lose. Who knows? Uh, probably like January, end of January, February uh, would be ideal for me. Hopefully in Nebraska. I'm, I'm really pushing that. I'm working on that. Um, I do like that Corey Anderson fight. It would be cool if Corey fought like September and got a, and got a win. And then, you know, John would hopefully probably going to fight in December. So, you know, unless Corey wanted to sit, but who knows, I guess I'm getting too technical. Into it. But, <laughs> uh, Corey, I like Corey or Jan January, February. See, I think Jan could be a good one well, as by well. By the way, because... I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of Jan, man. I, mm. I've been telling people forever that dude's the dark horse in the yeah, division. Yeah, absolutely. He's, uh, super, super dangerous on the ground. And let's not forget, he was beating the shit out of Gus until Gus decided to start mm. to take down. Yeah, he was beating the shit out of Gus on his feet. So uh, he's dangerous, and and you know, and it's, sometimes it's just cool to fight someone who just wants to get in there and fight and is humble and you don't have all the other bs you know so mm. it'd be cool to just get in there and just be super competitive with a super tough guy uh but at the same time i wouldn't mind beating the shit out of Corey Anderson too. <laughs> yeah for sure well we definitely hope you get the fight that you want a little bit disappointing you won't be fighting in october uh in in melbourne over no. here but you know no. we, we we can dream right we can dream. no look honestly Next time. <laughs> yeah Next time. look guest fighter guest fighter yeah we, we hope the hand yeah, heals maybe. up that's actually not a terrible idea i should i should try to get a guest fighter spot and come on hang out yeah, get go crazy in Vegas this past weekend, and then go crazy in Melbourne in October. I think I think you'd really enjoy it. Um, appreciate you guys taking me out. Why not? We would t- yeah, you, just like a, a typical day in Melbourne. Some sharks, you know, some kangaroos. <laughs> Everything can kill you here in Australia. So I think you love it. Man, I, sounds like a place I want to be. Excellent. Follow the man on Twitter and Instagram at Lionheart Smith. One of the nicest guys in MMA. Always appreciate your time, Anthony. Thank you so much for jumping on and chatting with us. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Hopefully, talk to you soon. Oh, yeah, that's right. El Wapo here. That means the pretty face. All you guys out there, you're listening to Submission Radio. Godspeed and party on. All right, guys. After a big international fight week in the cards, we wanted to get our next man on the program to congratulate him on some great coverage at UFC 239, the Hall of Fame ceremony. And the MMA Awards, you know him from his amazing work on TSN. Aaron Bronstetter, welcome to Submission Radio. Look at this. Looking like uh, Rain Wilson from The Office right there. What is going on? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, at least I wasn't the tall, gangly guy from the British version of the series that you compared me to. But um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for congratulating me. I appreciate it, guys, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, oh, that's it. That's the whole interview. I love it. Um, thanks so much, Aaron. We'll send you your checkers in the mail. Just quickly, uh, kicking things off, and I think this is something that uh, people may not realize you were a part of because so many people ripped it, but you were the man that got Israel Adesanya's reaction mm. to the Jorge Masvidal knockout over Ben Askren. I just wanted to congratulate you for capturing that and just wanted to ask you, what was it like being in that moment with Israel and seeing it go down live? I was the man and am the man who got that footage. And uh, to be perfectly honest with you, as many people have pointed out, I was very confused. Because, <laughs> and let me, let, me, let me paint a picture for you of, of why. So this is the setting. I'm in the back, you know, and they bring fighters and guest fighters and stuff to the back. And Israel's there. And I, you know, I asked UFC PR, can I get an interview with Israel? And he said, well, he's here for this one specific thing, but I'll ask him afterwards and see if he'll do it. And he said, yes, uh, because he's a gracious fellow. So yeah. um, I went to interview Israel and... Um, I, uh, my, my energy at that point in time is focused entirely on Israel. I was waiting for Israel to finish his other interview. I had no idea that Askren and Masvidal were even on their way to the, the octagon. So um, I'm interviewing him, and that's my focal point. I, you know, the part that you saw is about three, two minutes into the interview after I'd asked him about uh, UFC 243 and some other things. So all I, all I see happen is the man in front of me who I'm interviewing drop to the floor and start screaming. <laughs> So that's that's Which usually all I happens know, that, when you interview people, Aaron. This is usually it's my, usually it's my looks <laughs> that people are taken aback by. But at this point in time, he he drops the floor and starts screaming and freaking out, and I'm just like, well, obviously something big just happened. I don't know what it is. The rest of the people in the room are also freaking out. Um, so I'm my in my mind, as you can see, my the wheels are kind of spinning while I'm watching mm. Israel freak out, and in my head, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I'm not going to make this about me. I'm just going to let this breathe. And let him be him. 
And him being him is awesome because Israel is an awesome guy. Yeah. And the thing that a lot of people don't know about Israel is not only is he a high level fighter, he loves MMA and loves following MMA and loves tracking everything about the sport. Yeah. And that's why I think to him it's even unbelievable that he's at the top of the sport because how much he reveres the UFC and the fighters that have been in the UFC prior to him. And that's why when Israel fought Anderson Silva and Anderson got him all emotional, he was crying. Mm. Um, in the days prior to the fight is because of how much reverence he has for the sport and for Anderson. So he follows every the thing about the sport. And that's why he's saying, you know, Cuban Jesus and ghetto Jesus and whatever he was <laughs> yeah. saying is because like, that's what he thinks of, of like, he's a fan in that moment, just like anybody else. So mm. in my mind, I'm just like, I'm going to let this gentleman react in the way that he's going to react. And I'm going to step back. And at the end, when he's done, I will say, you know, Oh, that was Israel Adesanya. I cut that part out also, which is me saying, Israel Adesanya, everyone. He's fighting at UFC 243 against Robert Winter. But, uh, so, so I isolated the part where I look at my most confused because mm. I didn't want to put the whole interview out there. And this, this thing picked up like wildfire. It has over a million views on just ESPN's YouTube page. Wow. Um, it's, it's been seen by about 2 million people worldwide. So uh, 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 it's pretty crazy to think about that. And as a result of that, I've had a lot of dummies come out of the word work and write weird shit to me online, but uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on your show. But, <laughs> no, no, go for, uh, for it. Yeah, so um, a lot of people have been writing things to me that are very off-colored weird, but, you know, <laughs> that is what it is, and I've had to just kind of go with the flow on, on that. But I've also added, like, a, a, a lot of followers both on Instagram and um, and on uh, Twitter. I, I think I have, like, I never use Instagram. And I think I have, like, 250 followers or something on Instagram going into the weekend. And I've got over 1,000 now. Holy so now, shit. now, as a result of this, I'm like, okay, I, I've got pressure on me now to do stuff on Instagram. So I'm coming up with new stuff to record for Instagram and recording videos and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, as a result of that happening, I'm actually, it's, it's actually helped finally get my ass in gear and, and had me do some things for Instagram that I, I wasn't previously doing. So uh, thank you to anybody who has followed me on Twitter or Instagram as a result of this video. And uh, hopefully you get to enjoy a lot of the covers that I'm doing. And I, I'll do my best not to let you down. And I just keep trying to improve at this game. Um, so it's been a really wild 48 hours, to, oh, to say the least. Absolutely. And you say a couple of million. I mean, a lot of channels ripped it and didn't really even give you the, the appropriate credit that you deserve. So we wanted to get you on the program, make sure everybody follows you on, on, on Twitter and Instagram and checks your work out because it's always fantastic. Now, just quickly, on that knockout, when you did get a chance to watch it again, what was your thoughts on the way that uh, Masvidal was able to stop Ben Askren? Obviously, we saw that video. He was actually drilling that knee uh, 24 hours before the fight happened. And what do you think happens with him next? Because a lot of people are wondering if Covington's getting the next title shot if he beats Robbie Lawler, but UFC has this bankable star in Masvidal. And just looking at all the analytics and the numbers that he's getting on all the different websites and YouTube, this man is a bona fide uh, superstar right now, arguably one of the biggest names in the UFC after that knockout. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you got to strike when the iron's hot. That's why Darren Till got a title shot against mm. Ty uh, Tyron Woodley. So, um, let's start from the beginning of that question, which is the, the knockout initially. So Askren comes on Helwani's show yesterday and says, we were expecting him to do something crazy out of the gate. Now, I don't know if Askren had forgotten about that because the last thing you want to do in the situation with somebody running towards you is shoot a double because you're going to go head first into whatever they're throwing. So you're going to have to either have the utmost confidence in your chin that you can take whatever he's going to throw at you, whether it's a Superman punch, flying knee, flying jump kick like we saw Verdum do that one time, anything along those lines, um, like you have to have the mindset of like, I need to get out of the way and restart, not go for a double. So I don't know if Askren just had a momentary lapse of uh, reason in that moment, to quote mm. Pink Floyd, um, <laughs> and, and went for that, the double and got caught, uh, or if that's just what his instinct said to do because he uh, has a wrestling background. And when you are... The, the level of wrestler that a Ben Askren is, you default to wrestling. You know, wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. This is how I'm going to beat this guy. As soon as he gets near me, I'm going to try to wrestle him. So it was a bad idea. And to think now, and uh, shout out to my fellow Canadian, the road warrior, Jonathan Goulet, who's no longer a <coughs> note in history, is being knocked out yeah. in six seconds. And he made a funny yeah. tweet about it over the weekend. Ben Askren, the guy who was undefeated, a, a wrestling Olympian, is now victim of the fastest knockout in UFC history. And when you really think about that and process that, it seems crazy because you would think that, like, somebody who's a complete jabroni would be on the other side of that stat. <laughs> and when you think that it's someone as high level as Ben Askren is on the other side of that stat, you just realize how crazy the sport is, and that's why we love covering it. It's just, like, it's, it's a guy who was 
app, undefeated, untouchable, barely lost a round. And he's the victim of the fastest knockout in UFC history. Anything can happen in the sport, and that's why I love it. I, I yeah. I was gonna say. Oh, sorry, Cass, but I was gonna. I was just gonna jump in. I'll say. So you're thinking next title shot, Masvidal, basically. I don't know. I honestly don't know because right now we're in a in a time of recency bias where what we see is, um, you know that that's what resonates the most. But I still would like to see what Covington does first. I want to see how Covington. I mean, that fight's not far away. We're talking about three, four weeks. It's August third, if I recall. So. Why not wait and see? And this is what Dana White gets all upset with me for is, you know, I always try to get him to make these knee-jerk decisions uh, after the events. Um, but for this one, I don't blame him. He says, you know, we have to see how that division plays out and when, when Usman's going to be back. Because who knows? Maybe Covington has a really imp- impressive win over Robbie Lawler. And then everybody's like, oh, Covington needs to get the shot. You know, yeah. this is how we react. But, I mean, <laughs> to be able to do better than a five-second knockout against an undefeated fighter is, I mean, that's going to be a tall, tall order. Mm. Uh, just quickly sort of on Ben Askren we've got to touch on him because I think he, he he did a good job on Ariel's show of obviously you know kind of like Dominic Cruz you know you take a loss and you just kind of um, you don't make any excuses you just say look it is what it is obviously with Ben Askren the questions were how well will he do against UFC caliber competition you know the first fight was controversial against Robbie Lawler this one he got completely obliterated where, where do you think we sort of stand on, on those questions? And do you think, look, he got memed. He was on the on the receiving end of a highlight reel. And obviously the next, the next fight of his is going to be sort of the pivotal one as far as where his career goes. But do you think people can sort of chalk this up as like, look, this was just so crazy, so, you know, uh, out of nowhere that, you know, we can't really hold it against Ben Askren too much. Do you feel like there's a bit of a vibe like that? I don't know. I think that we need to wait and see. I think that um, the, the matchup that I just on Twitter about probably an hour or two ago um, suggested was Till versus, Darren Till versus uh, mm. Ben Askren. And the reason why is because we're going to see how good Ben Askren's chin is in that fight, and we're going to yeah. see if, if Darren Till has improved his grappling. Now, mm. regardless of the outcome of that fight, you've got something good. You've got either Till bouncing back against a guy who's a high-level wrestler who he's, he's whatever, he's either knocked out or finished somehow or, or somehow won a decision against, which I would think would be unlikely. Or you've got Askren getting right back into the win column, beating a guy that's a young, hungry guy with good striking power. Um, and, I mean, Darren Till right now, his stock has really never been lower, um, other than, I guess, when nobody really knew who he was. But... I think that if you take both those guys, you, you, whoever emerges from those two guys is kind of back on track. And I think you need to derail one train to get another one started. Mm, fascinating. And almost the matchup that people would wanted to see uh, when he first came into the company. Let's talk about John Jones and his close uh, win over Thiago Santos. Uh, who did you have winning in your cards, Aaron? And what round did it come down to for you where you sort of made your decision who the winner was? Uh, well, I had it, uh, Jones up 3-1 going into the fifth, so Tiago would have had to finish it in the fifth. Uh, and oh, wow. Thiago so you had you had Jones winning which rounds? 2-3-4. Okay. Yeah, I had Tiago winning round one, and I had Jones winning 2-3-4, and then I had Tiago winning round five, and that was a five, you know, that was a round that I think was kind of a coin flip, and I think there were some coin flip rounds in there as well for the one that I gave to Jones. Mm. Um, my podcast is out tomorrow, but I went on a pretty lengthy rant about how people who... So I, I went out after and said something was off with John Jones. I don't know if it was Holly losing or what, but something was off with him in that fight. And people got mad at me for not giving Tiago Santos credit. And my response to those people is John Jones is the greatest fighter of all time. If you take any fighter in the heavyweight or light heavyweight division and you put him against John Jones and they blow their entire shit up, their whole knee, everything in the mm. first round and he doesn't get a finish, that's a problem with John Jones. And if you think otherwise, you're not thinking. Because John Jones, if he is the greatest of all time in your mind, and in a lot of people's minds, I'd say probably at least 50% of the, uh, the MMA community, maybe somewhere in that ballpark, think that he's the greatest of all time. Then he should have absolutely no problem finishing anybody who's fighting on one leg for four more rounds. Do you agree? I, I would agree, especially when you look at, say, um, guys like Gega Musasi fighting him and beating him. At middleweight, you know, David Brent. And I, I guess, look, we could be saying that it's a different Tiago Santos, but nevertheless, he's had some pretty brutal losses, knockout losses at middleweight. So when you consider John Jones, a guy that, you know, I think most people would say John Jones is a much better fighter than Gago Mosasi and David Branch, and he's not able to finish Tiago Santos when he has one leg, I, I certainly see your point. 
Yeah, so it's not that I'm not giving Tiago credit. Tiago's a beast. He went five rounds with John Jones on one leg. It's, I mean, it's unbelievable. He had a split decision. It's like the closest thing that anybody's really had to beating John Jones is that fight, aside from that Matt Hamill BS from back in the day. Yeah. So if we're looking at it from that standpoint, something was off with John Jones. And John Jones said after the fight that he thought maybe he was drinking his own Kool-Aid too much. Maybe he, he said he wasn't nervous going into this fight. Maybe that allowed him to be complacent and know that he didn't have to do much to beat Thiago Santos. Now, the flip side of that is maybe he's just a genius businessman and he wants people to think that Daniel Cormier can beat him again to set up a super fight hmm. against Cormier and have people think mm-hmm. that Cormier's got a chance against him. Now, he'd what have a to long be play that would psych- be. Yeah, wow, that, would be a long, that, that would be a pretty psychotic long play to do that and <laughs> yeah. put yourself at risk against Tiago Santos. I wouldn't put, put him past gas. John Jones. He's, you know, the kind but of guy. Yes, this is who we're dealing with here. John Jones yeah. is the kind of guy that he, he does think long term. Mm-hmm. So mm. I don't know if that's exactly what he did. I don't think it's what he did, but I wouldn't put it past him. Um, mm. So right now, John Jones looked a little bit human again. It's the same thing that happened when he fought OSP. When he came back, people said, oh, he, he looked tired. He didn't look good. Then he fights Cormier and gets the head kick win. Mm. So maybe he's doing it again. Maybe he's trying to make it that look like he can lose again so that he can win definitively over a better fighter. Mm. Just quickly, Aaron, uh, before we wrap up, what would you like to see next for John Jones? There's a few sort of people in the works. you got your guys like Dominic Reyes. John is kind of looking towards December. Um, he said on Twitter, and uh, I know DC fights Stipe in August, so if DC can beat Stipe, Stipe again, do you think that's the time to do this DC Jones trilogy fight? I do. I think the DC versus Jones needs to happen next if DC is contemplating retirement. I think you need to have that, that big fight one more time, and I would love to see it at heavyweight. I know Dana wants to see it at heavyweight. Cormier wants to move down to 205 because he doesn't want people to think that if he beats Jones that it was because it was at heavyweight, but I don't think that would matter. Um, I think ultimately, if he is able to beat Jones at heavyweight, I don't think people are going to take away the losses at light heavyweight to him, and he'll be the greatest heavyweight of all time. I mean, if, mm. if he beats Jones, even though Jones is a light heavyweight, and he beats Stipe twice and then Jones, you have to call him the greatest heavyweight of all time. Do you, do you not? And I mean, he's a top three fighter of all time also. So I don't think that that, you know, there's, that, that would diminish it much if he beats him at heavyweight. Now, of course, if he's able to beat him at light heavyweight, then we're talking about, you know, again, you, you put him into that conversation of the greatest of all time. But would he be the greatest light heavyweight of all time? No, it would still be John Jones. Mm. So mm. I actually think he has more to gain from beating him at heavyweight and more to gain from competing with him at heavyweight. Um, so that's the fight I think that Jones should do next and that I'd like to see them line up next. And if Cormier ends up beating Stipe and then retires, I would like to see Jones versus Francis Ngannou. Like that, I think, would be the, yeah, the, wow. the next biggest fight you can make with Jones. But uh, would they make that fight? Would Jones accept that fight? I don't know. I mean, Jones was saying something very interesting during media day, which was my hesitation to move up to heavyweight is that the finishing rate is really high. And I've got a brain to maintain. I've got four kids, four, four young girls that I need to raise. Um, you know, I don't want them to have a dad whose brain isn't there. Um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, he says, if, if the money's right, I'd consider doing it. But otherwise, there's no real incentive for me to do it. And I, I think that that's a very fair statement. And I think that if he keeps running through, like he's basically now on the third generation of light heavyweights to beat. He beat all of the aging legends when he got into the division. Mm-hmm. Then he beat the next era, which is like the Gustafsons, the Cormiers. And now he's on the third division, which is the younger guys. I mean, he's only fought one guy younger than him in his entire tenure as champion or t- tenure in the UFC as a whole. And that was Anthony Smith earlier this year. So mm-hmm. now you've got guys like Johnny Walker. You've got Reyes. You've got Rakic. So there are all these new young lions coming up. And I don't think that Jones needs to fight Cormier or needs to move up to heavyweight. I still think that there's a lot for him to do at light heavyweight. Mm. And I think almost in this day and age as well, staying in your, di- in your division and defending your title is almost more impressive than going into another division and winning another title because that's been done about 100 million times. And with Jones saying that when he put on his muscle uh, against OSP, that slowed him down. There's a lot of things for him to think about, like you mentioned, the whole brain thing, avoiding the damage. So a lot of interesting things for John Jones to think about as we wrap up. Uh, of course, follow Aaron on Instagram and Twitter. Just quickly, Aaron, what are those tags for the people who are going to be looking for you on social? Okay, uh, on Twitter, it's at Aaron Brostetter. And uh, you can see how... My name's spelled, I'm sure, on the description of this show. And then on Instagram, it's at A Bronstetter, letter A Bronstetter. Uh, and you can course. go to tsn.ca slash UFC for all of our coverage. Of course, a great podcast as well. And guys, that is the end of the program. A big thank you to Aaron Bronstetter, Anthony Smith, Stephen Thompson, Chai, of course, yourself, Aaron, and Coach Winkle, John. We will be back with another episode of Submission Radio next week. Thank you so much for checking us out. And enjoy the fights from Sacramento this weekend.